Now then. Tis I. The situation may be more complicated than we anticipated. Indeed, I shall remain watchful. Ere thou goest, Another matter requireth thine attention, a young maiden full eager to... Wherefore inquirest thou of her fairness? Oh, very well. Be she damsel or devil, I shall direct her steps to Revenant's toll. Save thine insinuations for one given to such impropriety. Thou shalt not find me amenable. Far across the sea from the land of Doma have we travelled. We seek audience with the ruler of these lands. Who here speaks for you? We have traveled some several thousand miles across the sea, from the nation of Doma, in hopes that we might find sanctuary in these lands. Sanctuary, Lady Yugiri? Aye. Lying within Othard, Doma was under the dominion of the Galian Empire, as I'm sure you are aware. When the War of Succession broke out in Garlemald, we aspired an opportunity to free ourselves from the yoke of Imperial oppression and took up arms. Only to be crushed. And so I gathered what few domains escaped the reckoning and guided them hither to your shores. A War of Succession? Then the Emperor... Forgive me. You said that Doma was under Imperial rule, did you not? Doma is gone. Raised to the ground as an example to the other provinces. Twelve have mercy. And your people? On a ship anchored in Vesper Bay, flying borrowed colors. Many were complicit in the rebellion, or are kin to those who were. They will not come ashore until I send word that it is safe to do so. I sought an audience with your rulers, but was summarily refused. The lords of Ulda are not wont to entertain foreign refugees without suitable encouragement. 
Mayhap I was foolish to expect otherwise, but our supplies run low and we have young ones in urgent need of care. I have seen the tents outside the gates, however. We are not the first to seek asylum, nor will we be the last. Be that as it may, Ulda is no friend to Garlemald. Your tale would stir the hearts of many men and women here. The Sultana and the Syndicate will not be so easily swayed, but I shall see that you are granted an opportunity to plead your case. This is within your power? Well, far be it from me to boast, but I do have the ear of certain influential individuals. I am in your debt. Lady Yugiri, forgive me for observing, but your choice of attire seems like to evoke feelings of mistrust. Men are wont to fear the unfamiliar. We know this from experience. We seek only to spare the people of Uldar unnecessary disquiet. I shall defer to your experience, then. I thank you for your understanding. It seems I have urgent business with the Flame General. I leave our guests in your capable hands. I, Yugiri of Doma, am honored to meet you at last, Your Grace. To mark this auspicious occasion, I should like to present to you the finest treasures our humble nation has to offer. Alas, the circumstances which have brought me here today have divested me of both time and dignity. I come before you as a pauper in direst need of aid, to request that you grant my people asylum Nanamo, 17th in the line of U, welcome you to our city. Be at ease, Lady Yugiri. Although I myself have heard the tale of your misfortune, I would ask that you recount it once more for the benefit of the others here present. As you wish, Your Grace. For many years, my nation, Doma, suffered under the yoke of imperial rule, and my people yearned to be free. Thus, when a war of succession broke out in Garlemald, we sought to take advantage of the chaos and reclaim our liberty. Alas, our enemy proved less preoccupied than we had hoped, and our rebellion was put down in the most brutal fashion. Those who survived, how many do they number? More than 200 souls huddle within the cramped confines of our own galleon's hold. Yet this figure accounts for but one of a number of ships which escaped the purge. It is my hope that you will allow us all to dwell within your walls. Should that prove unfeasible, however, I humbly ask that you accept as many of my people as your resources allow. Pray understand, we do not beg a boon, but propose instead an arrangement. We would serve as soldiers or tradesmen until our debt is repaid. What are the Syndicate's opinions on this matter? I, for one, think it's a marvelous idea. Lady Yugiri and her people strike me as an industrious lot, and there are parts of the city which have yet to be fully restored. If they are willing to work, I see no reason not to let them. The head of the Mirage Trust is not known for his generosity. He sees profit in this. I agree. That said, these are foreign refugees. To admit them would require a formal resolution. 
Shall we call a vote? The law is the law. Lord Lolorito? Tell me, are you blind or willfully ignorant? Even now, our streets are choked with the displaced victims of the Calamity and Alamegan refugees. They live hand to mouth, subsisting on aid provided by the immortal flames, the cost of which grows ever higher. The wealth of Ulda is not without limits, my friends. And need I remind you that these refugees are prone to violence and criminal activity? You have all read the reports, I think. Without homes or employment, it is only a matter of time before men grow desperate and take that which they imagine has been unjustly denied them. Yet, knowing this, you would have us swell their ranks. Mayhap you think the brass blades and the flames are not hard-pressed enough? Some say the chairman of the East Aldenard Trading Company passes Gil thrice daily. This may explain how he came to be the wealthiest man in Uldar. Or it may simply be that he's ruthless beyond reckoning. Surely the Sultanate can support the few hundred domains Lady Yugiri represents. That our resources have been taxed, I do not deny. But we are hardly in danger of financial collapse. I move that an exception be made. An exception, Your Grace? I am suddenly reminded of a similar debate some years ago regarding a number of Alamegan refugees, if memory serves. What were your words that day? <sighs> ah, yes. The law is the law. And so our visitors remained in Little Alamigo. Mayhap our wise and benevolent Sultana would be so good as to enlighten us as to which other of our laws should not be upheld. Mind your tongue, Lolorito. My lord, I share your concern for the welfare of our great nation, but we must endeavor to take a longer view. You know, as well as I, that people can be a resource still more precious than Gil. Precious or not, they were never yet so reliable. And unlike those who frequent your establishment, I have no desire to gamble with my future. Ulda's greatest asset is, and has ever been, her material wealth. We risk this at our peril. One need only look to Telegi Adelegi's example for evidence of the danger in allowing sentiment to dictate policy. How far the vaunted Mirage have fallen, both in repute and profitability since he began employing refugees. How I choose to conduct my affairs is not your concern, my lord. A proposal has been tabled. Given its urgency, I move we forego further debate and call a vote. To accept the Doman refugees or not, those in favor, I bid you remain. Those opposed, I bid you leave. That it were within my power to welcome you and your people, Lady Yugiri. As you have observed, however, my authority in such matters is regrettably limited. 
Without the consent of the Syndicate, I cannot act. I understand, Your Grace. And I appreciate all that you have done on our behalf. The nerve of the man! If that bastard had not forsaken the Eastern trade route, little Alamigo would now be thriving. Oh, that you should have traveled so far under such dire circumstances, only to be refused in this manner is utterly unconscionable. Pray, accept my sincerest apologies. Now that the Empire no longer poses an immediate threat, they see little reason to maintain the pretense of unity. The Monitorists have grown especially defiant of late. Lord Lolorito most of all. But this is neither the time nor place for that discussion. How goes the fishing? Caught anything slippery? Aye. Our suspicions were well founded. The Serpent Reavers are indeed the culprits. The plot thickens. Has there been any movement in Thanalan? It has been blessedly quiet. Which is to say the Amalja are being no more or less of a nuisance than usual? Summoning a freet with such crystals as they have hoarded? Uriange too reports not out of the ordinary. Then we have our explanation. Your explanation for what, pray tell? For the recent spate of crystal thefts in Thanalan, we naturally assumed that the trail would lead us back to the Amelja. Yet it did not. It led us across the sea unto Vilbrand. Vilbrand? There have been reports of increased Sahagin activity of late. Oh gods, they mean to summon Leviathan? That is the way of it, I fear. Whilst conducting our investigation on behalf of the Mineral Concern, we came upon evidence implicating the Serpent Reavers. With the aid of the Maelstrom, I was able to verify our suspicions. Tis only a matter of time before Leviathan returns to harrow the seas. But there is more. One of the Sahagin, an elder by my judgment, spoke of attaining the gift and knowledge of eternity. Ugh. Such a disturbance in the ether. If I did not know better, I should think this device defective. And there is the explanation. Soon, soon it shall begin. Our Lord shall rise midst surging waves to wash away the finless ones. And I shall be granted the gift and knowledge of eternity, and with the emissary stand equal. Then shall I know no cessation, no oblivion. Whence comes this promise of immortality? The Emissary? We have outstayed our welcome.
the gift and knowledge. Are the two of you quite well? You... you shared that vision, did you not? Even before the Sahagin made mention of the emissary, I recognized Elidibus's words. He is behind this. But surely it is not within his power to grant the Echo. My lady, unless we act swiftly, Leviathan will rise again. The Admiral has already requested that we intervene to prevent this. Failing that, we are to attend the Primal's extermination. She will have our full cooperation. Let us make haste to Limsa Lominsa. I mean to play a part in this mission. Tataru, pray, take charge in my absence. My lady, are you sure this is wise? I am aware of the risks, but there is something I must see with mine own eyes. The true nature of the Echo. Very well. I shall not stand in your way. On the condition that you permit me to accompany you as bodyguard. Your company is ever welcome, Thancred. I take it something ill is afoot. Aye. A primal is about to be loosed upon Eorzea. A uh, primal? A godlike being whose very existence is a bane upon the land. We scions of the Seventh Dawn are sworn to put an end to their kind. I see. Know then that I am learned in the arts of war. In return for the kindness you have shown my people, I would lend you my blade. It would be most welcome. When contending with a primal, one can never have too many able allies. If you crave a more intimate understanding of the problems facing Eorzea, this experience is like to provide it. Be sure to come well prepared. Damn them. They have made thralls of soldiers and civilians both. Did I miss much? So that is how you fight in the Far East. Mental note, pick no quarrel with domains. But seriously, if I am to keep up, I must needs forsake elegance for efficiency. To the etherite!
You'll forgive me my lateness. I've been something of a liability of late, I know. Tis high time I set about making amends. <sighs> Long have you shriveled sewer walkers, tormented our kind. But no more! Your time is at an end! You shall perish with salt in your wounds and sea in your lungs. Lord of the world, hearken to our plea. Lord of the world, deliver us from our misery. Do you feel that? I know this sensation. It's the Echo. What? Such power! It is transcendent! Seven hells. <laughs> Strike me down if you will. It is futile. I have mastered the gift. I am eternal. Oh, mighty Leviathan, ruler of the seas, born of waters primordial. I offer unto you this frail flesh, that you might grant your faithful servants deliverance. I beseech you, come forth! Die, damn you! Heavens for Fend. Damn it all! My being ebbs away. It should by right be infinite. Am I not immortal? Curse you, emissary! You promised me everlasting!
Where did he go? What say you? Nary a single ship? Hells take that sea demon! Gather the survivors and get to shore. Leave the wrecks for the pirates. Leviathan wastes no time. The diversionary squadron is lost. For a mercy, it would seem the primal now makes for open sea. But why does he not press his advantage? Unless... God save us! He means to unleash a tidal wave! There used to be a hamlet beyond South Tidegate in Western Lanosha. Halfstone, it was called. Some years prior to the Maelstrom's founding, Leviathan rose from the briny depths and set about unleashing watery hell upon us. On that occasion, the company of heroes put him down before he could do too much damage. But when the bastard came next, this time in the wake of the Calamity, we were not so fortunate. Weary of ravaging our shoreline, he summoned a tidal wave which fair leveled Hearthstone and washed the soil away for good measure. The area was subsequently occupied by the Sahagin. Aye. The thrice-damned creatures transformed it into a spawning ground for their brood. Given the quantity of crystal stolen to feed him and his legion of thralls, we can be fairly sure that Leviathan is stronger now than in his previous incarnations. If that sea demon is left to wreak havoc, what befell Hearthstone may well befall a larger settlement, even Limsa. That cannot happen. The primal must be stopped. That was ever our objective, Admiral. But how are we to achieve it? The sea is Leviathan's uncontested domain. The ships of the third squadron could not close to within a hundred yards of the primal, nor could their cannons pierce his defenses. I have read the reports, Master Thancred. Our warships may as well have been bloody pleasure barges for all the good they did. Seven Hells! Is there no way that we might strike back? The Company of Heroes defeated Leviathan, having first lured him into an inlet. But we must needs contend with him upon the open sea. It will avail us little to consult past experience. Admiral, if I may. Speak freely, Marshal. By all accounts, Leviathan's most formidable weapon is the very sea itself. Waves and whirlpools, tides and currents, all these things are his to command. The key to victory, I believe, lies in disarming our foe. This, in effect, is what the Company of Heroes achieve with their ruse. We cannot lure Leviathan from the sea a second time. But what if we could weaken his hold upon the element of water? I have heard of devices capable of such wonders. They draw upon the power of corrupted crystals, I am told. If mounted upon a ship, such a device might be used to prevent Leviathan from bringing the full force of the sea to bear against us, rendering him no more dangerous than any other sea serpent. Of course! Sid built a similar device to grant the Enterprise safe passage through Garuda's Tempest, did he not? Begging your pardon, my lady, but to give credit where it's due, 
This is something I heard from an old arcanist friend of mine. It makes little difference who thought of it first, so long as it works. Beg the specifications of this device from your friend, and I shall pass them on to our people at Naldic and Vermelis. But before we proceed any further, I would voice one concern. Piercing Garuda's defenses is one thing. Suppressing Leviathan's attacks quite another. In matters of science, I am as a babbling babe. But I cannot well imagine that such a feat would be possible without a veritable mountain of corrupted crystals. The question being, do we have a ship big enough to bear such a burden? Mayhap not, Admiral. But two might. Recall you the tale of Mistbeard's greatest haul? It is said that he lashed two ships together, side by side, the better to bear his plunder. By your leave, we might attempt to repeat the trick. The gods know it would be quicker than building a new vessel. Mistbeer did this. Truly, Marshal, upon the subject of the Pirate King, you are as a scholar. Now, from what I have gleaned of these matters, the device will need to be in close and constant proximity to the target. To wit, we must lash our twin vessel to Leviathan. This in itself will be no small feat. Ramming speed will be required, but given the weight of the cargo, that will only be attainable with the aid of a towing vessel. Suffice it to say, the task of piloting said vessel will entail considerable danger, and I would not ask it of another. I volunteer myself. It will be dangerous for all involved, but we have no better recourse. Very well. Commodore. Assemble the remnants of the fleet at Morabi Bay. Give priority to our soundest vessels. The repairs can wait. Storm Marshal Slafirson, command of the operation is yours. I want that twin vessel ready to sail post haste. At once, Admiral. And then there is the small matter of slaying the beast. The fate of Limsa Lominsa rests upon your shoulders once again. Go well, warrior of light.
we Lominsons are sworn to strive, till sea swallows all, and swallow all it would have had Leviathan prevailed. That we still strive now, we owe in no small part to you. Not for the first time, you have delivered Limsa Lominsa from the wrath of a primal. Never has our nation known a stouter ally. On behalf of my people, I give you my humblest thanks. Tis meet that I give thanks to old Mistbeard, too, for his fine solution. Whatever else he may have been, tis clear he was a resourceful soul. Would that I had a man like him in my service. Before I set foot in these lands, I had no inkling that the people of Eorzea contended with such mighty foes. Suffice it to say, their existence came as something of a shock, as did the idea that they could be defeated. This experience has served to remind me of the vastness of the world and the boundless potential of man. Though I am but a refugee in this realm, I would fain be of use to you in your fight. Know that I am tutored in one of the foremost combat arts of the Far East. It may seem outlandish to the Eorzean eye, but should any of your people care to learn, I would be pleased to initiate them. And I will see to it that they are grateful. I have no doubt that your knowledge and skills will serve us well. Besides, your art is not so outlandish as you think. Would you not agree, Master Thancred? Not escapes your searching eye, Admiral. Few are privy to this information, but Limsa Lominsa is home to a certain secret fraternity. Its members are trained in a form of combat not unlike your own. By my judgment, it should not be beyond such individuals to adapt to the techniques I witnessed you employing with such admirable deftness. I am heartened to hear this. I too noted a kinship between your style and mine own, though it seemed to me that you fought differently in the beginning. Uh, I, I suppose I did. What can I say? I'm a man of many talents. <laughs> Though you may labor to believe it, Thancred was once something of a scoundrel who fraternized with the criminal class in these parts. You stole her! You jest, of course. But for a chance encounter with Alfino's grandsire, he might never have left Limsa Lominsa, or received an education in Charlian, or taken up his post in Uldar, which is where he trained in the Blade, lest you wonder. Minfilia, please! <laughs> it would seem there is more to you than meets the eye, Master Thancred. Lady Yugiri, I am told that you and yours came to Eorzea seeking permanent resettlement, and that many domains have since been engaged as frontier hands at Revenant's Toll. Mordona is many things, but a place of refuge it is not. Know that I would like nothing better than to furnish your people with a new home here on Lominson soil. Alas, wracked by instability as we are, our nation is in no fit state to take you in. Yet I'll not have it said that we turned a blind eye to your suffering. Until such time as we can do more, I pledge to send provisions. We are in your debt, Admiral. I realize that it scarce qualifies as repayment, but if it please you, I shall set about sharing my martial knowledge with your people at once.
You wished a word in private. The better not to spoil the festive mood. History repeats itself, Admiral. As the Kobolds did before them, the Sahagin resorted to summoning their god over a territorial feud. They acted in self-preservation. It may be that the Sahagin initiated this particular clash, but how it begins does not interest me so much as how it ends. I have not forgotten our conversation, Yashtola. I am aware that man bears part of the blame for the Primal's existence. Nor am I ignorant of the Sahagin's reason for acting. They sought to secure a place to breed and multiply that their kind might survive. Self-preservation, as you say. But we have as much right to live and thrive as they. If our own survival is threatened, are we to lay down our arms and welcome oblivion? Nay. And so you kill, that you might live. Yet if living is a right, then that right belongs to all peoples, be they men or beastmen. I'll not deny your reasoning, but when a storm gathers, it falls to me to see my people safely through it. That is my duty, and I shall do it. As must we all, Admiral. Stay the course then, but know that it will lead to no good end. Man has ever put himself first and foremost. To justify his actions, he clads himself in the armor of righteousness though it be a fancy of his own making. In this, mayhap the Garleans and we Domans are not so different. Eorzea has become as a raging sea. If we are to keep our heads above the waves, we cannot scruple to drown the man next to us. When hopes of coexistence founder, strength must determine who has the greater right to live. I have been reflecting upon the events which took place during our visit to Vilbrand. If you have a moment, I would share my conclusions with you. Please, bear with me. When the Sahagin Elder summoned Leviathan, he employed the power we have come to know as the Echo. Though I cannot well explain the how of it, it would seem he became immortal in so doing. When the Admiral subsequently slew him, his spirit emerged from his lifeless flesh, a consciousness shorn of physical form. Thus transfigured, he took up residence in the body of his minion with the ease of a man donning a favorite glove. Long have I known that the Echo allows one to pass through the walls of a man's soul. But never did I imagine that it could free us from our own flesh, nor less that our souls could then occupy the next corporeal vessel to take our fancy. It was of this that Elidibus spoke an existence which knows neither cessation nor oblivion. And yet, though the Sahagin had mastered his gift and thereby become immortal, he was by no means invulnerable. As we both bore witness, he was ultimately absorbed into Leviathan. And the import of this observation? If the Asians' mode of existence is indeed the same, it can be inferred that they too are not invulnerable, that they can be destroyed. There exists a legend which tells of souls who are reborn upon the cusp of each umbral calamity, that they might stay the encroaching darkness. 
To most, it is but a fairy tale. Yet recent events have given me cause to wonder. Could the legend in fact refer to the Echo? Much and more yet remains unknown, but I am confident that all will become clear in time. For the present, however, what matters is that the key to defeating the Asians may at last be within sight. With Uriange's aid, it is my hope that I shall fathom this matter ere long. Oh, I was just about to send for you, my friend. Is Otomis? Grave tidings from the Charlian motherland, my lady. It doth concern our distant allies, the students of Baldessian. What of them? My lady, the Isle of Val, which for many years hath been the Order's home, is no more. No more? Whatever do you mean? I relate only that which hath been conveyed unto me by our agents. An etheric wave of the highest magnitude was recorded in the region. Soon thereafter, twas observed that the isle had ceased to be. Tis postulated that a magic was evoked, like in power to Ultima. Twelve preserve. If there are no other matters, I move that today's meeting be adjourned. It is done, my lord. I... <clears throat> forgive my impertinence, my lord, but these orders... I am uncertain as to what end they serve. Revolution. Come, you must have gathered by now that Tataru is given to exaggeration. As you can see, I am quite well. Uldah, on the other hand, is not. This riot was anything but an isolated incident. There is a restlessness in the air. Tensions long simmering are at last threatening to boil over. Uldah is a nation infamous for the great disparity between the wealthy and the poor. The majority of the populace accepts this state of affairs because they believe that every man bears responsibility for his own lot in life. To an Uldan, money is the foremost, and some would say the only measure of a man's worth. Small wonder that the wealthiest wield the greatest influence. So where do the refugees fit into this social hierarchy? What place is there for those who fled Alamigo and the destruction of the Calamity? Plainly, there is none. They have no wealth, no power, and no worth. To the Uldan way of thinking, they may as well not exist. Choosing to ignore their existence, however, is patently not an option. General Rauban and the Sultana understand this, which is why they ordered the Immortal Flames to provide the refugees aid and succor. Yet none would dispute that the expenses incurred by this policy grow by the day, with no end in sight. This has prompted more and more Uldans to question their obligation to aid these worthless wanderers. 
while more and more refugees have come to resent their treatment at the hands of the sneering citizenry. The manner of Lord Lolorito's refusal to grant the Dolmen's asylum bespoke a disdain for all refugees, an attitude shared by the rest of the Monetarists. And you may be sure they make no effort to conceal their opinions. It was only a matter of time before the refugees united in protest, nor is it any surprise that some among them would ultimately resort to violence. <sighs> that the immortal flames should choose this of all occasions to engage in joint training exercises with the other grand companies. By the time they return, the situation may well have deteriorated beyond mending. Commander Swift has kept us apprised of your recent activities. You've made great strides towards quelling the violence. Despite our best efforts to determine what provoked this uprising, the truth continues to elude us. Have you uncovered aught which might shed some light on the mystery? This information does not leave this room. The Syndicate's decision to reject the Doman refugees' appeal for asylum had lasting repercussions. A number of those displaced by the Calamity claimed it was proof of a policy of discrimination. Together with a group of Alamegan refugees, they organized a series of demonstrations to protest against the Sultanate. Demonstrations which became heated, but did not descend into violence. Until a certain incident served as a call to arms. A unit of brass blades sent to supervise a demonstration loosed arrows upon unarmed protesters. It was this atrocity which prompted the refugees to take up arms. I need not tell you what followed. We assumed at first that the attack was born of a miscommunication. When emotions run high, they happen. But suspicions were raised regarding the unit's commanding officer, whom I ordered interrogated. Sure enough, our fears were soon confirmed. The dog confessed that a merchant had offered him coin to give the order. A merchant in the employ of Taleji Adeleji. Taleji Adeleji. But he spoke in favor of the Doman's cause, and has ever seemed sympathetic towards the refugees' plight. Why would he do such a thing? Know you of the Cartano Reclamation Bill? It is a proposal to annex the Cartano Flats so that refugees may establish permanent settlements. When last I looked, that was disputed territory. Aye. Some might even call it a battlefield. The destruction wrought by Bahamut was greatest at the Cartano Flats. That much is common knowledge. What is less well known is that his rampage laid bare ancient Alagon ruins, of which no record existed. There are certain differences of opinion as to how these ruins should be handled, which is why each nation maintains a military presence in the region to this day. Yet differ though we may, we are still allies. Therefore, in the interest of preserving the Aeorzean Alliance, we have reached an agreement. Any conflict which may arise during the course of military exercises in the region shall have no bearing on relations between our nations. In full knowledge of this delicate state of affairs, Taleji Adeleji proposed the Cartano Reclamation Bill. 
A shameless bloody ruse which stands to benefit him in but one conceivable way. If successful, he will gain control over the disputed territory under the guise of assisting in the resettlement effort. And you can be sure he'll build an orphanage next to every Alagan ruin. The man would threaten the unity of the Aeosian Alliance and risk countless lives for personal gain. He walks a path all his own, independent of any faction and beholden to none of his fellows on the Syndicate. By inciting the less fortunate to violence, he hopes to convince others that the Cartano Reclamation Bill is the only viable solution. His sympathy for the plight of the Domins was not but posturing to gain credibility with the refugees. Of that there can be no doubt. Forgive me, but what could possibly motivate Telegi Adelegi to go to such lengths? What is so special about these ruins that he would risk his position on the Syndicate, and, most likely, charges of treason against the Sultanate? Omega. Pardon? An Oligon monstrosity, not unlike the Ultima weapon. Mayhap larger, we know not. It has yet to be fully excavated. Oligon inscriptions indicate that it was created to fell Bahamut himself. If accurate, it might explain why Nail Van Darnus chose to bring the Red Moon down upon the Cartano Flats. Given the ends he went to to ensure Eorzea's annihilation, Destroying the one weapon which could stay the Elder Primal may well have seemed like good sense. When first I bore witness to the power of the Ultima weapon, I doubted the evidence of my senses. And now you tell me there is another such weapon. One which could contend with Bahamut. Bahamut! Aye. We were skeptical ourselves. Truth be told, until the Ultima Weapon's existence came to light, we thought the inscription had been mistranslated. At present, Omega is more akin to a fossil than a tool of war, having long since ceased to function. As such, its true potential cannot accurately be gauged. However, if someone were to restore it, as the Carleans did the Ultima Weapon, I have little doubt that he would wield untold power. Power enough to subjugate Uldar like as not, and the rest of Eorzea besides, which is doubtless why Telegi Adelegi yearns to have it. That he should aspire to world domination. He who has ever walked two paces behind Lord Lolorito in matters of commerce. Tis in acknowledgement of his own limitations that he seeks this power. Woe betide us all, should we allow him to have it. Pray waste no time chasing rats. Only a fool would believe that secrets can be kept in Ulda. It would seem the implications of the Sultanate's refugee problem are rather more far-reaching than we assumed. Scions of the Seventh Dawn, on behalf of the people of Gridania, I bid you welcome. Your presence is of great comfort to us all in these days of uncertainty. I summoned you here to share tidings of a most urgent nature. But a short while ago, the Great Elemental spoke, and his voice was clarion in its intensity. Ramu is returned unto the forest. 
Scarce had his words ceased to echo in mine ears when we were visited by an emissary from Little Solace. Our guest informs us that the Sylphs, too, have sensed the presence of the Lord of Levin. Though his exact whereabouts remain unknown, we may safely assume that the Primal was summoned within the heart of the Sylphlands. Unlike the other Primals you have encountered, Lord Ramu is no raging avatar of destruction. He is revered as much for his wisdom as his strength, serving as both arbiter and guardian to his children. Given that we and the Sylphs found a way to share the Twelve's Wood, it is my hope that this sagely immortal will be amenable to reason, and that conflict may be avoided. Blessed as you are with the power of the Echo, you are one of the few among us who may commune with a primal without fear of influence. I would ask, therefore, that you represent us in this most delicate of negotiations. The Twelve's Wood has suffered enough. Upon this, we and the Sylphs, and I would venture Lord Ramu himself, are in perfect accord. Let us not endanger our shared home by engaging in unnecessary hostilities. Dear friend, I beseech you, safeguard the peace which exists between our peoples. You have my thanks. Pray make for little solace, then. A member of the Order of the Twin Adder awaits you there. He will advise you on how to find the Lord of Levin. An ill wind blows through the forest. Yet, it is not only the Twelve's Wood that flinches at its coming. All the lands of Eorzea shiver in dread anticipation. Have care. Praise thee, servant of Hydaelyn. Bane of Ifrit, Titan, Garuda, and Leviathan. I am Ramu, guardian of the children of the forest. Thou tramplest upon sacred soil, bringer of light. By what right doth man intrude in this sanctuary of the Sylphs? Gridanians proffer peace? Their words are born of delusion. Thine offer, an insult. Thou speakest of harmony, yet carest not for my children's desires. They did but wish to dwell beneath these boughs in solitude. Yet, even that was too much to ask of man. Thus did they turn to me for succor. The sentence I pronounce upon thy kind is just. 
Redanian or Gallian, it matters not. The good intent of one excuseth not the misdeeds of the other. Thy conflict have brought naught but anguish and misery unto the forest. All blame doth lie with the darkness that resideth in the breast of man. Whence sprung this calamitous seed? In the beginning no such duality existed. Were light and dark given form when man was born? It would explain much. Not least why strife and sorrow follow ever in thy wake. Thou canst not deny the urgings of thine own nature. Knowing that thy mere presence here portendeth tragedy, wilt thou persist in this pretense of peacemaking? Thou bearest the crystal which I bestowed upon my wayward charges, that they should entrust so precious a gift to thee. Thou standest apart from thy kin. Thou art the bringer of light, I. But there is something more in thee. Very well. I shall consider thy proposal. Shouldst thou survive my trial? If thou wouldst champion the cause of harmony, I must have proof that thou art fit to play the role. Worthy mine eye, and prove to me thereby that thou hast strength enough to stay the darkness which threateneth to consume thee. Yet if thou shouldst be found wanting, know that all men shall perish in the storm of my judgment. Come to me, bringer of light. I shall await thee on the field of battle. Urianje, it is rare indeed to find you so far from a tome. The Lord of Levin himself. Never till this day had I looked upon his visage, save in painted renderings made faint by time. Ever shall this scene remain etched in my mind's eye. <clears throat> Beg pardon, my lady. I must beg thine aid on a point of research. If thou art resolved to face Lord Ramu, I would ask thy leave to observe the event.
I have taken thy measure, bringer of light. And I judge thee a worthy champion. The task of excising the sin that hath taken root in man's heart is thine. Shrink not from employing thy strength in service to the forest and the wider realm beyond. Like hungering shadows do the enemies of harmony gather, and meekness will but feed them. If man is to be delivered from the dark, it shall be by thy guiding light alone. Stray not from the path, for if thou dost, thy people shall be truly lost. Thou hast slain the Lord of Levin. A regrettable act, but a necessary one. In witnessing thy struggle, a truth hath been revealed unto me. If I mistake not, it may yet prove a chink in the eternal armor of the Asians. But let us conclude our present business. I shall expound upon my findings at the Rising Stones anon. You are returned to us, dear friend, and none the worse for bearing the heavy burden which I did press upon you. Most glad am I of this. I am informed that your efforts to negotiate a peace with Lord Ramu ended in conflict. Pray tell me, what befell? Ramu made trial of you? I fear there is truth to his claim. It is the darkness within us that attracts the darkness without. It cannot be denied that misfortune follows man. For evidence, one need only look to the conflict brewing in Cartano, or to the rising flood of refugees. Our shared struggle against the Empire should have served to seal our union. Yet the ties which bind the Alliance strain under the weight of gross self-interest. As the scars of the Calamity begin to fade, so too does our sense of common purpose. Yet now is scarce the time to forget our shared responsibility. If this new sprung realm is to survive beyond its infancy, it must needs be nurtured by all. Eorzea must be as one. Yet I fear that dream is still far off. On behalf of the people of Gridania, and the Elementals both, I thank you for all that you and your fellow Scions have done. Full oft have I been compelled to look to you for aid of late and offered all too little in return. As leader of this nation, I shall endeavor to prove a more worthy ally to your cause henceforth. Lord Ramu has departed, yet the keening of this ill wind grows no less insistent. Voices of the forest, pray speak and I shall listen. What unseen evil begets this unease in my heart?
If everyone is ready, let us begin. Uriange, the floor is yours. As all here assembled now know, in its final hours as our Order's headquarters, the Waking Sands did play host to a most unexpected visitor. I speak of the Asian clad in white, Elidibus. Unwelcome though his presence was, his words that day did serve to confirm a truth long suspected, that the Asians are eternal beings to whom physical destruction is as a temporary inconvenience. In the intervening time, Ariange and I have striven to discover a means by which the Asians might more permanently be slain. And tis my belief that we have found the thread that will allow us to unravel the twisted skein of their existence. In the moments prior to Leviathan's most recent manifestation, the Sahagin Elder who summoned him was observed to undergo some manner of ascension. The etheric readings taken by Yashtola at the time of this transfiguration have proven most enlightening. The disruption to the flow of ether was sudden and dramatic. So tangible was the agitation, I scarce had need of my goggles. The significance of Yashtola's readings might better be understood in the context of mine own, taken at the instant of the Lord of Levin's demise. Unlike the primal, the Sahagin was not subject to etheric dissipation. Before discussing our new discoveries, it may benefit us all to recall what we know of etheric behavior. Let us begin at what some might call the end. When we who dwell in the material realm die, our spirits dissolve into the flow of ether and are returned to the ethereal realm. In turn, the restless energy which suffuses that plane streams back into our world, giving rise to new life. Tis as the heavens did decree, the way of all mortal souls. Twixt this world and the next do the ethereal currents swirl, bearing the very essence of life. Thus doth the cycle of birth, death and rebirth continue unabated. Primals behave somewhat differently. In order to manifest and then maintain a physical presence in this realm, they must consume vast quantities of ether, most often in the form of crystals. Though they may seem to live, their flesh is but ether given shape. Thus, a defeated primal leaves behind no broken corpse. Rather, the essence of its form seeps back into the land whence it came, and the energy of its shattered spirit is called back to the ethereal realm. And there it waiteth, till next the prayers of the faithful do draw it forth from the sea of ether, to take their offering of crystals and make for itself a new body. Which brings us on to the third group, the so-called Immortals. They exist in a manner all their own. Quite. Even as the Sahagin Elder fell to the Admiral's musket shot, I witnessed the release of an ethereal cloud, which immediately took possession of a nearby minion. A soul that dissipateth not upon the death of the flesh. The secret of life everlasting and in the claws of a Sahogan, no less. But I wonder, what would happen to one of these obstinate spirits should there be no suitable host for it to claim? If mortal death entails a return to the ethereal realm, 
It seems doubtful that the soul of an immortal would venture there. Nay, it merely withdraweth the distance unto the shore of the ethereal sea, perchance, but no further. Yes, it exists in neither this realm nor the next, abiding instead in the space that lies between them. The Asians took control of Thancred by means of a crystal of darkness, an artifact which, if our theories are correct, serves as a gateway to the place I have just described. I was hoping people had forgotten about that. I am sorry, my friend. For a mercy, the weary road of our research hath brought us unto an answer. The Sahagan ascended to an immortal state, but he did not possess a crystal of darkness through which to flee this realm. Thus was he consumed by Leviathan. If we could entrap the spirits of defeated Asians in like manner, and thereby deny them resurrection... Therein lieth the path to victory. Thou art most perceptive, my lady. Only when we have trapped the bodiless soul within an ethereal prison can we hope to defeat its unnatural constancy. Thus might even an eternal paragon be consigned to oblivion. These feats are, of course, far easier said than done. At present, we lack a viable means to entrap and extinguish an Asian soul. Yet, I believe it to be possible. The pieces of the puzzle lie before us. We have but to put them together. I will depart at once to convene with the sages of Charlian. Together shall we divine the steps by which our goals may be achieved. I have the utmost faith in you, Archon. Beg pardon, Antecedent, but I would raise one final matter. Even now, a Charlian survey party seeketh to ascertain the fate of the students of Baldessian. Their findings shall soon be known to us. Though you harbor feelings of dread, I bid you surrender not to sorrow, but abide instead in hopeful prayer. I shall, Archon. Thank you. Tell me, General, what think you of Alfino's bold endeavor? I think it is more than bold, Your Grace. His organization would pave the way for a united Eorzea. Well do I understand his impatience, since facing the common threat of the Ultima Weapon, our nations have seemed farther apart, not closer together. Considering the many problems we face, should we not be glad that someone else is taking the initiative? We have all pledged our cooperation, yet the grumbling continues behind closed doors. Ulda is not alone in her duplicity. I myself have doubts as to the good this organization will achieve. 
With the inclusion of the finest soldiers of the three grand companies, it promises to be a fearsome military body. But whom will it serve? Even under the watchful gaze of the scions, it is not unthinkable that such a force could perpetrate a great wrong. Does it not concern you that a significant proportion of its financial backing came from the coffers of the syndicate, that those unprincipled worms might forge this extraordinary gathering of warriors into a private army? I have trust in the Scions, Your Grace. They have spared us no end of trouble at the hands of the Primals. If they seek reinforcements, I deem it unwise to deny them. As for their finances, full many gave generously. And though our nobles proffered a sizable sum, their coin did not spill from the pockets of Lolorito and his cronies. And what of the presence of our stalwart adventurer friend in this endeavor? I doubt the warrior of light would betray our cause. Yes, there is that, I suppose. Yet I have known people to change. Whether we will or no, the events of the age hurl us this way and that, like a dust devil skipping across the sands. Cannot be done about Telechi. I have explored all avenues available to us, Your Grace. But as Uldan Law now stands, we lack the evidence to convict him of any crime. To arrest him on spurious grounds would only play into his hands. He has all but committed treason, and yet we can do nothing? Then what good our government? What worth the royal house? How deplorable this mockery of justice! Have faith, Your Grace. It is not over. The incident with the new frontier hands? No, no, you need not elaborate. I have been following their progress with no small amount of interest. Brave men and women all. They do our nation a great service. The existence of a fortified outpost in Mordona will do much to dissuade the Empire from trespassing on Curthus soil. Right glad am I that you have chosen to lend your support to this endeavor. Never let it be said that House Fort Tom does not acknowledge the efforts of her allies, or her debts. Twas in the spirit of gratitude that I arranged for sundry supplies to be delivered to Revenant's Toll. That the shipment should chance to be waylaid by heretics is poor fortune indeed. Poor fortune, I say, yet not without precedent. If you would know the truth of it, these incorrigible villains grow more organized with each passing day. This new unity of purpose we attribute to their leader, the Lady Iceheart. But though I have devoted significant resources to the task of identifying this woman, we have yet to learn so much as her birth name. What we do know is that the heretics speak of Iceheart in reverent tones, and would gladly embrace death rather than betray her. Such loyalty is rare indeed, and I fear to imagine what so committed a collective might achieve. The brigands have not yet been so brazen as to risk direct confrontation here in Dragonhead. Some few of their number have, however, been sighted not far to the west of here, and with ever-increasing regularity. 
A visit to Whitebrim Front may bring you the answers you seek. Will you brave the snows, knowing what implacable foes may lie in wait? Halone's blessings be upon you. Though I take no pride in the admission, many of mine own countrymen are not so well suited as you adventurers to dealing with such foes. Were they dragons? It might be otherwise. But truly, I could not wish for a finer ally. You have done much for my house in the past, and I have no doubt but that I shall have cause to celebrate your deeds again ere long. Should you learn aught of value, pray return to me forthwith. A warm hearth and a warmer welcome shall be waiting for you. Your return is most timely. Of their own accord, my thoughts had turned to your task and the progress thereof. I confess my imaginings tended toward the grim and bloody. But you are here now, and I suspect such frivolous wonderings do little justice to the reality of your travails. Tell me, what did you learn of Iceheart? Indeed, and this transpired at Snowcloak. Of all the highlands, that towering wall has borne the worst of the region's brutal shift in climate. So inhospitable has Snowcloak become that we have still to survey the area in its entirety. Could its frozen heights conceal the heretic's hideaway? Mayhap a more robust reconnaissance effort is in order. Putting such considerations aside for the moment, we still know far too little of this Iceheart. That she is capable of commanding such a band of fanatics bespeaks natural authority, and no small measure of charisma. As much as I would like to fathom this mystery with you, the situation has grown beyond my personal purview. I am bound by duty to inform the Temple Knights and request that they bring this matter to its conclusion. Giving the glowing reports the new commander has garnered thus far, I am certain that they can be relied upon to take appropriate action. Though Iceheart's true identity yet eludes us, you have provided us with a point from which to begin. Sometimes it takes but a single stone to prompt an avalanche. On the matter of the stolen provisions, I have already made arrangements for a second shipment to be sent to Revenant's Toll. I could not well allow such an honorable venture to be undermined by one miserable setback. Comrades, your presence here this day signifies the momentous choice that each of you has made. With your strength now pledged to the Scions of the Seventh Dawn, you are beholden to no single nation. You stand as the vanguard for a united Eorzea. From this moment forth, I declare you crystal braves. Let us mend this fractured realm and face our enemies as one. Whether it be the Beastmen and their primals, or the conflict in Cartano, it is plain that the nations of Eorzea cannot solve the problems which plague the realm. Thus does it fall to some few heroic souls to succeed where they have failed. Come, take your place at the Scion's side as guardians of Eorzea. 
And together, we shall fight for the freedom of all! For the freedom of all! A rousing speech, Alphano. Or should I say, crystal brave Commander Leverieux? Please, Antecedent. The title is honorary. I shall not be leading the troops into battle, as it were. We are of the same purpose. Let us join hands and do what must be done to save this land. The Scions stand ready. I'm eager to see what the Crystal Braves might accomplish. This shall prove an interesting time indeed for the Scions. Yes, I'm listening. So our worst fears are confirmed. The entire Isle. Such power defies comprehension. Truly? Kryal is alive? Thank the Twelve. I see. Pray, inform me if her condition changes. Yes, I shall pass on your words to Arianger. My thanks. I shall contact you anon. When I learned of the loss of the Isle of Val, I dared not hope that my friend had survived. Yet, by some miracle, it would seem she has. She's still to regain consciousness, it is true, but better that than death. Putting this happy news to one side, we must now endeavor to make sense of the readings taken by the survey party. It appears the etheric disturbance which accompanied the Isle's destruction is of a magnitude alarmingly close to that of Ultima. Could the Asians be responsible for this devastation as well? I wonder. Have you heard aught from the Mother Crystal since the battle with the Garleans? Then she speaks to neither one of us. Heidelin silence portends not but ill, I fear. Louisois, I pray you yet watch over us. Hail to you, Scion. How might we serve you? Commander Leverieur bade you serve us? These are welcome tidings indeed. Given the sensitive nature of the task, I could not rely on one of my own. That which I'm about to tell you, I tell you in the strictest confidence.
Some days ago, we received certain documents from an anonymous source. They notified us of the presence of a Garlean agent within the ranks of one of the Grand Companies. Following some discreet inquiries, we identified a suspect among the Immortal Flames, whom we detained for questioning. Alas, the man was not our agent. He was but one of many men in the agent's employ. We pressed the traitor for a name, but he had none to give. He claims never to have met his master, whom he knows only as the Ivy. He was, however, certain that this Ivy had coiled itself around every part of the Immortal Flames. It would seem our quarry joined the company some time ago, and gradually recruited others to his cause. These conspirators are the vines by which he learns our secrets, all without exposing himself. It won't be easy to identify the ivy amidst this tangled mass of subterfuge, but we have a tendril in our hands, and we shall follow it all the way to the gnarled root. Now, much as I would prefer to proceed with due discretion, Circumstances demand that this matter be settled post-haste. Garlemald's war of succession nears its end, and it is feared that the Empire will soon resume its march on Eorzea. When it does, we can ill afford to have traitors in our midst. The ivy must be rooted out now. We must begin by apprising General Roban of our findings. I would ask that you accompany me to the Hall of Flames and remain on hand to see that things go smoothly. Assuming the Ivy's tendrils are as widespread as we believe, he will be aware that an investigation is underway, and if that is the case, he may well move against us. We must be prepared for anything while taking care not to betray our purposes by seeming prepared. A simple enough task for a one-woman army like you. Well, well. What brings you here, my friend? She is here at my behest. Greetings, Roban. It has been a while. Hilbert, you old scoundrel. When they told me you'd be visiting, I scarce believed my ears. But look at you! The honored captain of the Crystal Bloody Braves. Who'd have imagined, eh? Not many. But fewer still would have imagined your destiny lay in politics, old friend. Aye, we've both come far, have we not? Lest you wonder, Hilbert and I go back a long way. We've been friends and rivals since we were lads. The last time we saw each other, Alamigo had just fallen, so you can guess how many summers it's been. And in all that time, not a word from the fool! Ah, well, my dealings tended toward the modest and mundane, unlike some I could mention. As I hear it, no sooner did you reach Thanalan than the brass blades clapped you in irons and dragged you off to die on the blood sands. Being a stubborn sort, you won a thousand matches and earned yourself a place in the people's hearts while you were about it. Then, with your mountain of prize money, you bought the Colosseum and secured a seat on the Syndicate. Those balls, brother! Rags to riches does not do it justice. You're a hero to the common man! Pa, spare me. I am no hero. If anyone is worthy of that title, it's our friend here. Next to her, I'm little more than a glorified butcher. 
But you, Ilbert, you sell yourself short. By all accounts, you are an adventurer of some standing. I like to think that I did my part for the greater good. But if you're no hero, then I'm no adventurer, not in this company. Anyway... I have tidings. So there has been progress. I've let it be known that this meeting is a reunion between old friends. None will give your visit a second thought. To convene elsewhere would only attract attention. Let us speak here, in plain view of all. So it is we who have been compromised. Telegi Adelegi's machinations have shaken Uldar to her foundations. In such uncertain times, a man's loyalty may be bought for a fistful of kill. But if this snake has truly been in our midst for as long as you say, we must needs consider a far graver possibility. Conspiracy. Could it be that the Monetarists have been in league with the Empire from the first? Very well. I will have my most trusted men investigate the matter. Continue your inquiries in the meantime. It does me well to see you again, old friend. When next we meet, let it be over a flagon of ale. I look forward to it. Let us reminisce of bygone days, and drink to the future of our homeland. Flame General, you wear the mantle well, old friend. I must work hard if I'm to keep up. Well, it would seem your services were not required after all. I dare say we have Roban's prudence to thank for that. Still, I was glad of your presence. My thanks, Sion. Have faith, my friend. You need only state your case with confidence and clarity. Commander Leveilleur, it is both an honor and a pleasure to meet you. I am Emmerich. Lord Commander of the Temple Knights. Alfino Leveilleur, at your service. Your reputation precedes you, Sir Emmerich. I think we will find that we have much in common. Speaking of reputations, yours towers over us all. Does it not? It does indeed, Lord Commander. I am not too proud to admit that I have followed your activities with an interest bordering on fascination. Full glad was I to learn that you would be joining us. Now then, shall we begin? We know full well that the Garleans will return in force ere long. What is more, we have yet to achieve a lasting victory over the Primal Menace. 
the beast tribes continue to summon their gods, and each incarnation is stronger than the last. Ishgard is not immune to these threats. I must reiterate that it would behoove your nation to rejoin the Aorzean Alliance. Once again, I must respectfully disagree. On what grounds? Despite their presence in Kerthus, the Ixal do not concern us. The territorial claims pertain to Gridanian lands, and it is the people of Gridania whom they harry. Consequently, the Holy See judges this to be a Gridanian affair, and Ishgard does not intervene in the internal affairs of other nations. Even were that not the case, our forces are wholly committed to the Dravanian conflict. We have not the knights to spare. As for the Galians, we are not ignorant of history. We have observed the rise and expansion of the Empire, and we agree that it is only a matter of time before they resume their campaign in Eorzea. Then surely it would be in our best interests to present a united front. Mayhap one day, but not yet. Gaius van Belsar is dead, and the legion of conscripts he left behind lacks the will to fight. We think it highly unlikely that they will emerge from behind the walls of their castra for some time. Forgive me, but if Ishgard's position has not changed, why did you agree to this meeting? It was not only as a representative of Ishgard that I came here. Pardon? It is not within my power to change Ishgardian policy, regardless of my personal feelings. There is, however, one area in which I may exert a measure of influence. Concerns have been raised over the supplies House Fortin has offered to Revenant's Toll. These have led to calls for restrictions on the provision of aid to foreign powers. I can ensure that the shipments continue unabated. Sir Emmerich, we would be in your debt. No, you would not, for I require something in exchange. Of late, there has been a flurry of Dravanian activity, the purpose of which was not immediately clear. However, our astrologians have since observed alarming changes in the heavens. The dragon star waxes unnaturally bright, and there are whispers that it portends the resurrection of Midgard Sorma. The fallen guardian of Silvertear Falls? That's absurd. Full many times have I gazed upon the dragon's corpse still wound around the Agrius, and wondered how different our world might be if it yet lived to plague the skies. I do not know, and I do not wish to know, nor does any son of Ishgard. Yet the mere presence of Dravanian forces is not sufficient grounds to send knights to Mordona, whatever our astrologians say. As I told you before, we have not the forces to spare. But we do. So you will intervene on our behalf if we agree to watch over the Keeper of the Lake. Do you accept these terms? I do. I will see that you are kept abreast of any developments. I regret that we could not come to a similar agreement on other matters. But I understand that you are not at liberty to make such decisions. Nevertheless, I hope that what we have accomplished here today will serve to demonstrate to your countrymen that we can work together towards a common goal. Mayhap one day we shall look back on this moment as the first step towards a united Eorzea. Mayhap we shall, Commander. What is the meaning of this? 
The caravan, my lord. It's been attacked. It was Iceheart, my lord. What? By the fury! All our precautions were for naught? The tales do not do you justice, warrior of light. Yes, I know who you are, and you know who I am. I was given the name Izel, but I earned the name Iceheart. This endless cycle of hatred, of bloodshed, of sorrow. You would see it continue, O oh noble warrior of light. I would not. I will not. I will bring an end to this war between dragon and man, no matter the cost. In time, you will come to understand that what we do, we do for the greater good. For Eorzea. For Hydaelyn. Change has come to the Garlean Empire, and we must discuss the implications. The rumours are true, then? The War of Succession is ended. It is. A new Emperor reigns in Garlemald. Who? The birth and all too rapid expansion of the Garlean Empire is commonly attributed to the strategic brilliance of Solus Zosgalvis, yet he did not rule alone. Several members of the royal household also distinguished themselves during his reign. Nevertheless, it was the eldest son who stood to inherit the throne, until his most untimely passing. I thought us fortunate when I learned that the Emperor had died without naming a successor. Would that the Garlean Empire had died with him. It was the grandson and his uncle who had the strongest claims, was it not? Indeed. Yet claims count for little without the power to assert them. High Legatus Varus Ye Galvis is a respected military leader. Not so his uncle. So, young Varus has torn the crown from his uncle's grasp and taken his place at the head of the Empire.
Given the troubled nature of his succession, the new emperor will require time to seal his grip on power. Yet have no doubt but that he shall, for there are none left with strength enough to oppose him. Since the success of Operation Archon, the remnants of the 14th Legion and the forces occupying Alamigo have done naught but fortify their positions. But you can be sure they'll be ready to march on us again, if their Emperor gives the word. When, not if. They say this Varus was so set upon Eorzean annexation that he spoke out against the Meteor Project. Plainly, the new Emperor's intentions are of great concern to us all. I propose that we set aside the Cartano dispute for the present and discuss what measures the Alliance might take to prepare for a resumption of hostilities with Garlemald. Moreover, I move that we re-examine the question of how our former allies in Ishgard might be persuaded to retake their place at our side. Could Eorzea but stand as one, twould deal a grave blow to our enemy's ambitions. Well, I suppose we should be grateful that they have finally acknowledged the inevitability of Imperial attack. Who knows? They may even do something about it. If only the leaders of Ishgard would follow their example and stop hiding behind their gates, praying for the coming storm to pass them by. But that is a discussion for another time. At present, I am more concerned by the fact that the Alliance's mooted preparations will be made known to the Garleans many moons before their coming. So long as the Ivy eludes our grasp, no secret is safe. Minfilia, am I right? None other. I bid you welcome to Revenant's Toll, and thank you for traveling so far on such short notice. <laughs> As if I could ever say no to Urianje. Moonbreeder is an accomplished Charlian scholar and an authority on Etherite technologies. She has played an invaluable role in our search for a means to capture Arsian souls. Charmed, I'm sure. Moon! Gods, it's been ages! Longer, sister. A joyous reunion indeed. Well, of course it is. Moon and I are like twin sisters. Save in appearance and aptitude.
Everyone, if I could have your attention. We have with us an esteemed guest who has come from Jalian to assist us. I bid Moonbreda join us here that she might share with us her extensive knowledge of etherites. Also, as many of you are already aware, she has been overseeing our research into white orosite, a sample of which she has been good enough to bring with her. Well, I had to come, didn't I? You'd have to be bloody daft to turn your nose up at a chance like this. Where better to conduct my final tests than a land so steeped in ether you can taste it? Tis plain the passage of the years hath done little to dampen thy youthful spirits. And nothing at all to reform thy youthful manner. Orianje, where in the hells have you been hiding? Uh, unhand me. I come all this way, and that's what you have to say to me. I much preferred when you were pleading with me to drop everything and hurry to your side. What was it you said? None save thee can satisfy this need. Go on. Thine artless attempts to misrepresent mine all too innocent motives do thee little credit. <clears throat> mine intent, as well thou knowest, was but to impress upon thee the gravity of the circumstance. Lest thou doubt, a deiform entity shall shortly be summoned, save if thou and no other grantest my compeers thine aid. You still haven't found it then, your missing etherite? We have not, no. We know that Iceheart teleported to an etherite not far from the first, yet even after careful analysis, we could not locate the second beacon. We now suspect that the heretics destroyed the second etherite to impede our pursuit. Our allies continue to scour Snowcloak for Iceheart's sanctuary, but we have no guarantee that they will find it. Yet it must be found, for even now Iceheart prepares to call upon Saint Shiva. I'm sorry, but if the Aetherite's been destroyed, then that's that. Although, you're absolutely sure she used the first Aetherite, are you? She didn't just use teleportation magics? One of our own bore witness to her escape. I can say with absolute certainty that Iceheart used the Aetherite. In that case, there might be a way, so long as the ethereal current is still flowing. Truly? How? We use the current to recreate the beacon. As you know, etherites are a bit like lighthouses. We use them to reconstitute our physical forms when crossing the ethereal sea. Without them, we'd lose all sense of direction, and our essence would dissipate. However, we don't rely solely on these beacons. There are currents of ether which flow between them, currents which help guide us to our destination. Now, these currents will gradually dwindle away to nothing if an etherite is destroyed. But, if even a sluggish flow remains, we could theoretically use it to direct a surge of concentrated ether towards the void left by the beacon, and thereby fill it up again. Like opening the floodgates to fill a dry riverbed. Though, correct me if I'm wrong, but would we not need a veritable reservoir of ether? In concert, we might manage to channel a sufficient volume, yet that is not my chief concern. 
to direct the flow of so great a volume of ether with the requisite precision would be a nigh impossible task in itself. I barely succeeded in facilitating travel to an unattuned beacon. That which you describe sounds considerably more difficult. And dangerous! Every person who has attempted to teleport in this fashion has died in the process. They, however, did not have wide aura sight at their disposal. I can use it to channel all the ether you can give me into the etherite. However, white aurasite cannot retain ether for an extended period of time, so we would need to infuse it immediately beforehand. Just so you know, I'd confidently give this plan better than even odds of success. And if the worst comes to worst, your people won't suffer. Though it risk the lives of our best and brightest, we have not the time to seek other options. If the ethereal current still flows, we shall carry out Moonbreeder's plan. That's the spirit. Let's roll the dice. You should never have come here, Warrior of Light. I labor only to forge a lasting peace. A peace you would deny us out of ignorance and blind faith. No matter. If it is our fate to be at odds, then it is mine to strike you down. We whom gods and men have forsaken shall be the instruments of our own deliverance. Partake of my flesh. Fill this vessel with your light. Walk amongst your brothers and sisters once more. O oh, Saint Shiva, still the hatred within our hearts and bless us with eternal grace. Fool. Blind, bloody fool. You, of all people, should understand the suffering war begets. That no sacrifice is too great if it brings an end to the violence. Mine is the righteous cause. You fight in a war you do not understand. A pawn of liars and schemers. And they are no less ignorant than you, following the creed of their fathers without question, never thinking to ask why. Trapped in a delusion of their own creation and blind to the truth.
Warrior of Light, redemption is not beyond us. We who walk before may lead those who walk after. Seek the Keeper of the Lake. See with eyes unclouded. Do, do not squander Mother's gift. Hear, feel, think. And so the vessel withdraws, a predictable outcome. Nevertheless, La Habrea will be pleased. How unfortunate. On behalf of the Holy See of Ishgard, allow me to express my deepest thanks. Never before have we been required to contend with a primal. Indeed, there were fears in some quarters that our knights might not be equal to the task. From what we have now learned of these beings, I can say with certainty that we would have lost a great many men had the Scions not intervened. Then the argument for preemptive action should be self-evident. Perchance now you will reconsider my proposal that Ishgard move against Natalan. Ere we first met, a similar proposal was tabled, but the Holy See decreed that we were to observe, and that military action should be taken only in self-defense. All things considered, it was not an unreasonable decision. Since the Calamity, two vigils have fallen to the Horde, while Garuda has never shown any inclination to storm the Gates of Judgment. Which is why this unprecedented crisis and its resolution may prompt a change in policy. You who have faced these primals know well the threat they pose. Ishgard did not. Not until now. And there is naught like a brush with death to change a man's outlook. At the very least, this should silence any lingering objections to our arrangement with Revenant's Toll. The Holy See may even feel moved to grant us its formal endorsement. So far as it is possible, the Scions shall be compensated for their service. We should be grateful for any aid you can provide. As a gesture of good faith, I shall withdraw my previous request. Your people are doubtless needed elsewhere. That will not be necessary. We too have a vested interest in watching Dravania's movements. I see. Once more, I must thank you. Sir Emmerich, if I may, do you truly believe that Midgard Zoma could return? The heavens are a window unto truth, but those who interpret their movements are not infallible. I requested your involvement as a precautionary measure. But of course! You sought an excuse to compensate us from the first, mindful of what would happen if Revenant's toll were taken by your enemies. Ishgard is not wont to aid its neighbors, but that does not preclude it from manipulating them to serve its own interests. Choose your next words carefully. Do you know what sort of man becomes Lord Commander of the Temple Knights? 
one who comes from good stock. I did not, yet here I am. Now, why do you suppose that is? Because I swiftly learnt to tell the difference between words, deeds, and beliefs. You are correct, Master Leveo. Ishgard desires to see Revenant's toll flourish, as it would present a troublesome obstacle to our enemies from the south. We are so glad to be of use to you. As we are to you. Ours is a mutually beneficial arrangement, lest we forget. One born of necessity. The dragons grow more restless by the day, and the heretics harry us nigh without cease. We have contended with such troubles for centuries, but there are limits to even our endurance. Yet as a pauper is loath to part with his meager possessions, the leaders of Ishgard are not wont to render up their trust to outsiders. But with perseverance on our part, they may yet be made to see the light. Nevertheless, one must take care when walking the road less traveled. Wise words, Sir Emmerich. I shall make a point to remember them. I must apologize for my earlier outburst. I hope it will not sour our good relations. Not at all. You but spoke from the heart. I trust you understand that at times my duties may prevent me from meeting with you. On such occasions, my second-in-command will speak for me. Lucia, at your service. Pray excuse our reticence. We are but wary of speaking too freely, lest our sentiments be made known to our enemies. Know that the Lord Commander and I are of one mind. For the sake of Ishgard, and of Eorzea at large, I pray our peoples can put aside their differences. Those who dwell in the past risk losing sight of their future. Should aught befall one of our shipments, pray inform Lucia immediately. You may also relay to her any words you might have for me alone. Not being of Ishgardian birth, she owes no allegiance to any noble house, making her as near to incorruptible as one can find in my homeland. Suffice it to say, I trust her completely, and so may you. Which reminds me, Lord Orchafon, if you would be so kind? Certainly. In times such as these, trust is ever in short supply. Mayhap this will go some way to rectify the problem. The results of our investigation into the heretic's recent attacks, as well as our interrogation of the merchant you detained. Sir Emmerich, I cannot thank you enough. Think nothing of it. Ishgard may be many things. But it is no friend to Garlemald. Did I not tell you to have faith, my friend? Words cannot well express how glad I am to see you return to us hale and whole. Needless to say, I am most eager to hear your account of that which occurred in Curthis, assuming you're ready to speak of it. Excellent. I shall summon the others at once. Iceheart used her own body as a vessel for a primal soul? Master Louisois's writings make no mention of such a possibility. Can we be certain this entity was a primal? As certain as we can be that good King Mogomog the Twelfth was a primal, I should think. Both were ostensibly summoned. Let's not quibble over definitions. 
Of more concern is the implication that Iceheart retained her will, even after she was possessed. We are talking about a mortal, wielding the power of a primal. It can't possibly be that easy, can it? There must be some sort of sacrifice required. Or maybe she's just special? What qualities this woman possesseth, I know not. But full sure am I that she was groomed for this role. Few are privy to the secrets of summoning, and but a single party standeth to profit from their dissemination. Well, I wouldn't presume to comment on how the lass came to know about summoning, but I will say that what she summoned was a primal. The readings were the same, or near as damn it. Strange as it all sounds, it's really no different from what you've faced before. Then mayhap it is time that we re-examined our previous encounters. <sighs> Pack your things, Ida. We're going back to Gridania. Yes, sir. About Iceheart's final words to you. Hear, feel, think. Hydaelyn speaks to her as well. If Iceheart is blessed with the power of the Echo, she will doubtless have used it to further her goals. Or could it be that it was a revelation granted her by the Echo which first set her on this path? She did say that the Ishgardians were blind to the truth. Do you think she has knowledge of the origins of the ishgardian dravanian War? It would do much to explain her unwavering conviction. Did not the Lady Iceheart implore thee to seek the Keeper of the Lake? And did she not imply that in so doing thou wouldst come to see with eyes unclouded? Midgard Zoma was a king amongst kings who reigned for centuries on end. But he is dead and his wisdom lost to the ages. Unless the Ishgardians' fears are well founded. It would seem we have yet another reason to stand watch over the Keeper of the Lake. For a mercy we are well positioned to do so. Iceheart, Shiva, Asians, and Midgard Zoma. I shudder to think how they're all connected. I have heard truly bothersome business. No, I do not foresee a problem on that front. The main concern is Roban. There is no telling what the brute might do. Have the blades watch him in the flames day and night. You may leave the Sultana to me. I shall personally attend her grace. Sever one of the East Aldenard trade routes. That ought to keep Lolorito occupied for a while. Nanamo Ulnamo. For my sake, pray be a good little Sultana to the last. Welcome back, my friend. I have already received word from Alfino. To think that Flame Marshal Huayu was the Garlean agent. I know not what to say. Together with Robon, Eline lent us much needed aid at the time of our order's founding. She was particularly passionate about the need to tackle the primal threat. When we discussed the subject, her eyes fairly shone with determination. Whatever else she may have been, I choose to believe that it was her true self with whom I spoke then. But now is not the time to dwell on such matters. I have an important announcement to make regarding our effort to defeat the Asians. We shall begin as soon as everyone is assembled.
My thanks for coming, friends. Moonbreeder, the floor is yours. By now, I'm sure you're all familiar with White Aurasite, the miraculous material that'll allow us to capture Asian souls. Back at Snowcloak, we verified its ability to absorb vast amounts of ether. Alas, it leaves something to be desired in the area of stability. The stone can only store ether for a short while before expelling its contents. In addition to Aurasite's inherent limitations, we must needs be wary of our enemy's strength. Our foe draweth upon an infinite wellspring of power. Even should we succeed in entrapping him, the stone will not long contain his wrath. Meaning that, if we want to kill the swine, we'll have to be quick about it. Tis our belief that an Asian soul may be permanently undone if smitten by a sufficiently concentrated burst of pure ether. The only trouble is, we can't say for sure how concentrated the burst needs to be. Without knowing how much ether an Asian soul is composed of, we're basically guessing. Our sole clue lieth in thy struggle with La Habrea. During that encounter, Heidelin bid you forge what she called a Blade of Light, a weapon which took the form of a luminous stream of energy. Based on your description, we believe the blade with which you vanquished your foe was composed of ether. Admittedly, your victory proved ephemeral, as La Habrea was able to use a crystal of darkness to flee into the space that lies between our world and the void. The fact remains, however, that Heidelin placed the means to destroy the Asians in your hands. Be that as it may, it would be unwise to assume that you will do the same when we next encounter such a foe. Quite so, my lady. We must needs find the means to forge our own blade of ether, one to equal that which Heidelin did benevolently bestow upon her champion. That is all well and good, but it seems to me that producing such a blade will require a prodigious quantity of ether. Whence will it come, pray tell? Um, oh, what if we had two pieces of white aurasite? One to trap the Asian, and the other to store the ether for the blade? Oh, nice try. But it's as I said, the stone won't hold ether for any length of time. We'd still need to collect the stuff there and then, sorry to say. And therein lies the rub. Finding a way to create the blade whenever and wherever we choose. It would seem more research is in order. I'm going to linger a while, perform a few more tests on the aura site. And I could do with some help. Oriange. Why don't you lend me a hand? M mine apologies, but I am required at the Waking Sands. Lady Minfilia hath given me sole charge of the premises. It would be unseemly to leave them unattended. Sole charge, you say? So you're basically alone there, then? Well, that settles it. I'll just have to come to you. While you were afield, word arrived from the Charlian Motherland. You will recall that a survey party was dispatched to investigate the incident at the Isle of Val. What they discovered was troubling, to say the least. According to the report, the Isle has been erased from existence. It was as if a hole had been torn in the very fabric of reality. Aye, yet the mystery endeth not with the Isle's disappearance. It hath come to light that a number of scholars in various other locales were reported missing at a similar juncture. What's more, they all had something in common with the head of the students of Baldessian. Every last one of them was researching a phenomenon called dimensional compression, or the rejoining as the ancient texts call it. 
I'll be damned if that's a coincidence. All indications suggest Asian involvement, but I sense that a force greater still is at work. The entity the dark beings call the One True God. We must pray that my dear friend Kryl regains consciousness soon. If she bore witness to the Isle of Val's final moments, she may be able to shed some light on this mystery. Following the Calamity, the forces of the 14th Imperial Legion entrenched themselves in strategic locations across Eorzea. So swiftly did they accomplish this, it was suspected that they had received help. To think that it came from Huayu, my right hand. There is more. We have reason to believe that Huayu didn't deal exclusively with the 14th, she also answered to a higher authority in Gollumald. But this higher authority could not have been the Emperor. By consenting to the media project, Solus Zos Galvis showed himself to be more concerned about preventing the spread of primal influence than claiming Eorzea for the Empire. He would happily have seen the lot reduced to ash. We believe a number of high-ranking figures within the royal household were against the decision, but that they knew better than to oppose the Emperor openly. Of course, this didn't prevent them from making clandestine provisions, in which Huayu played a part. Alas, these provisions did not prevent Dalamud from falling, and the ensuing chaos changed the face of the realm forever. Yet Eorzea survived. To all intents and purposes, the Meteor Project had failed, and the Empire was left to rue its lack of a decisive means to eliminate the Primals. Until, that is, it stumbled upon the Ultima Weapon. Even before the accursed thing was dug up, it seemed to me the 14th had the might to overwhelm our weakened armies. Yet they chose to hide behind their walls. Why? The Black Wolf was wary of making the denizens of Eorzea desperate, lest more primals emerge to bleed the land. The discovery of the Ultima Weapon, however, emboldened him to resume his war of conquest in earnest. But there was one in Garlemald who believed that Van Belsar's actions were premature. One who stood higher in the Imperial Army's chain of command. He ordered the Legatus to halt his advance only to find that the Black Wolf had slipped its leash, and that the 14th now acted alone. In a bid to bring Van Belsar to heel, he used the agent he had planted in Ulda prior to the Calamity to undermine the Legion's efforts. A man who outranks Van Belsar, yet opposed the late Emperor's decision to annihilate Eorzea. This could only be the former High Legatus of the Galian army, now known as Emperor Voris Zos Galvis. So he was Huayu's true master. But one of several in actual fact, we've learned that even as Huayu served the Empire's interests, she sold Imperial secrets to a certain faction in Eorzea. In so doing, she helped to maintain the status quo, thus prolonging the conflict. Considering who stands to profit from war, it isn't hard to imagine who her other masters were. Seven Hells! You mean to say that she was a double agent? Uh, triple, if you consider her services to Van Belsar and the new Emperor as separate. As neatly as these pieces seem to fit, one aspect of the puzzle remains unclear to me. By whose will was the Marshal feeding intelligence to the heretics? And try as I might, I fail to see how aiding their cause would profit either her Imperial or Monetarist Masters. Could it be that another hand is at work here? 
If so, why you must be made to reveal whose it is. <sighs> Not only have I lost a trusted friend, now I must interrogate her as a stranger. Not a pleasant task, I grant you, but a necessary one. Unless we weed out the ivy, root, stalk and stem, it will simply grow back. I know that full well. Those closest to Huayu have already been detained, and I will question them alongside her. General, pray keep in mind that there may be unwitting abettors among them. All will be treated fairly. On that you have my word. Those who are innocent have no cause to fear. You have ever been a friend of truth, General. I hope the unpleasant task of weeding out falsehood will not detain you too long. Though it be for the sake of Eorzea, doubting one's comrades is poison to the soul. And with that, I take my leave. All these years, I've been made to dance to their tune. How could you, Huayu? How could you side with... them? Those cankers! Who take from this land and give naught in return! Who use their power to disempower and grow fat while the people starve! I know you can hear me, monitor and scum! Your crimes will not go unpunished! One day I will purge this land of your sickness! Before the eyes of the Twelve, I swear it! I shall have no further need of you this day. Your Grace. I fear that not even my own chamber shall remain private for long. Has the situation grown so grim? Ever since he proposed the Cardinal Reclamation Bill, Telegi Adelegi has risen to greater prominence upon the backs of impoverished refugees. The Monetarists were ever united in their pursuit of profit, but the man's actions have torn a rift in their ranks. They snap at each other as rabid dogs. Yet now is not the time to be bickering among ourselves. If this bickering is a threat to law and order, might you not have grounds to dissolve the Syndicate? Would that the solution were so simple, Admiral. Alas, my moving to dissolve the Syndicate is certain to spark outrage among the influential merchant class, whom the Cabal represents. This would serve to exacerbate the current unrest, and peace would slip still further away. Be they rich or poor, Natives or refugees, all who reside in Uldar have a right to pursue happiness. It is the duty of a ruler to protect this right. If I am to perform my duty, I must needs tread warily. It would not do to make enemies heedlessly. Were Lord Lolorito here, he would doubtless say that I have my head in the clouds. A ruler is required to take a wide view. Try as we might to cater to all needs, some will inevitably be overlooked. As such, there shall ever be citizens who feel aggrieved. It cannot be helped. But as you have informed us, the monetarists take no view but their own. They hunger for power while the masses starve. In the absence of a common cause, it seems beyond any one individual to make Uldar whole. 
and the presence of a Galian agent within the immortal flames only makes matters worse. Even accounting for Uldar's historic reliance upon mercenaries, such a grievous breach of security is unprecedented. I fear this business will provide the monetarists with a rod to beat Rauban. Eorzea can ill afford for the immortal flames to be dampened now. Ere long, the Garleans will turn their ravenous gaze toward our lands once more. If we are to resist their might, our nations must stand together. Yet for this to happen, our nations must be whole. Cannot be done to improve the situation in Ulda. The true wealth of Ulda lies in the health, happiness and hopes of her citizens. Alas, the citizens shall never know these things so long as their lives are ruled by the ambitions of the few. The monetarists claim to represent the best interests of the people, but in sooth they desire only to manipulate them for their own selfish ends. For the government to serve the people, it must be formed of the people. For Ulda to move forward, it is not only the syndicate that must be dissolved. Nay, you jest. My friends, it was for no other reason than to make known to you mine intent that I requested your presence here. When I make my declaration to the people, chaos shall inevitably ensue. As the last monarch in the line of Ul, I make unto you this request. Help Roban to preserve order, and protect the people. Forsake them, and you forsake yourselves, for a strong Eorzea will ever have need of a strong Ulda. Your Grace, are you certain of this? There is no other way. When the time is ripe, the nation shall become a true republic. Both royalists and monetarists shall cease to be. Ulda will no longer belong to kings or queens or merchant princes, but to her people. Roban, forgive me for casting aside all that you have toiled for in my name. Beyond this gesture, I am powerless to help my subjects. We have a guest from Ishgard who wishes to speak with you. I believe the two of you have met. We have. I had hoped to speak with Commander Leveilleur as well, but I cannot afford to wait any longer. The Lord Commander sent me hither to request your aid in a matter of grave import. You see now why I had Tataru summon you. Now that we're all assembled, perhaps you would be good enough to elaborate on the nature of the matter which brought you to us. The Observatorium's astrologians have sounded the alarum. Last night, the Dragon Star burned with an intensity not seen in 15 summers. Not since the Dravanians engaged the Empire in the Battle of Silvertear Skies. Hmm. The northern sky doth burn full bright upon the Worm Lord's call. The red behemoth beckoneth, and flame consumeth all. The old Curthen rhyme, aye. The brightening of the dragon star is said to accompany the roar of a great worm. 
the astrologians believed that it was Midgard Soma himself who cried out on this occasion. After an absence of centuries, the King of Kings did return to lead his kind against the might of Garlemald. Only to fall in his duel with the Agrius, proud flagship of the Galian fleet. Devoid of life, his corpse remaineth entwined about the Magitek monstrosity even unto this day. Ariange has the right of it. Whatever this alteration in the Dragon Star portends, the Great Worm has shown no sign of life. Tataru, have the Domans reported aught out of the ordinary? Correct me if I'm wrong, but if Midgard Zorma had roared, wouldn't we have heard it here in Revenant's Toll? Roar is but a figure of speech. Dravanians can communicate in ways beyond our kin. It is for this very reason that we are forced to look for signs in the heavens. We cannot say with any confidence that a great worm roared at all, much less that it was Midgard Sorma. Only by directly examining the Keeper of the Lake can we be certain. However, it will take too long to gain the Holy See's approval to dispatch the Temple Knights. Therefore, Sir Emric would entrust this task to you. Do you accept? We knew you would not disappoint us. Now if you would excuse me, I must return and assist the Lord Commander. We have precious little time to prepare. To prepare for what, pray tell? When a great worm roars, his brethren cannot choose but answer. We prepare for battle. Who treadeth now upon my bones? and waketh me from slumber sweet. Thou hast forgotten the face of thy lord. Remember, mortal, and fear me. By her gifts hast thou earned a moment's reprieve. Guided by a star. <laughs> My people have heard the song. Ishgard shall burn. Sons must answer for their father's misdeeds. We do not forget. We do not forgive. Seven children did I sire. One now singeth of retribution. I rise to join in the chorus. Thou art powerless to silence us, mortal. 
Yet thou shalt not live to labor in vain. Thy reprieve is at an end. Trickery is thy shield. This frail, noble creature is not gifted, but chosen. Hearken to me, Hydalin. I remember, and I consent. Fear not, mortal. I shall not harm thee. Thinkest me an oath breaker. Thou art mistaken. If thou comest to harm, it shall be by another's hand, not mine. I did but strip thee of thy mistress's feeble blessing. Thou didst profit much by her grace, but no more.
The dragon song heraldeth our beginning and an end. My friend, I can scarce believe it. You confronted the Worm Lord and lived to tell the tale. I give thanks to Helone for your preservation. It is our sole cause for gladness. Your encounter with the Keeper of the Lake served to confirm our fears. A great worm has roared, and it makes little difference if it was one of the two in Eorzea, or any other. The Dravanians are coming. I am told that Ishgard has magical defenses against Dravanian attack, though I am not privy to their exact nature. Will they be enough to repel a massive force? Ishgard has weathered countless assaults over centuries. This will be no different. And now that you have confirmed the threat, none can ignore the Lord Commander's calls for the wards to be strengthened. I dare not presume to speak for him, but I expect the Lord Commander would sing your praises. I must away, but we shall meet again soon. Countless assaults weathered, and this will be no different? Why am I not convinced? Now that everything's calmed down a bit, relatively speaking I mean, I thought it might be a good time to share our progress on the weapon. I believe we're on the verge of a breakthrough. Well, don't keep us all in suspense. Just in case anyone's forgotten, let's start by reviewing what we already know. So, an Asian is an immortal because its soul doesn't return to the ethereal realm when its host is defeated. Instead, it flees to the place that lies between our world and the Void. Therefore, the first step to permanently defeating an Asian is preventing its soul from making this journey. And if you recall, when we last gathered here, I had verified that White Aurasite has adequate capacity to entrap the beings, albeit only briefly. Which left the small matter of their extermination. Aye. To unmake an Asian soul, one must needs smite it with a concentrated burst, or blade, of purest ether. However, we wanted for both the data and the means to forge such a weapon. Short of experimenting on an actual Asian, you see, there's no way to gauge how much ether its soul is made of. As such, we don't know what etheric density our blade needs to have in order for it to work. So we'll just have to make the densest blade we can and hope for the best. Though, that would require a lot of ether. Hang on a minute! Why didn't we think of this before? White Aurasite can hold an absolute heap of ether, can't it? Please tell me you're joking! God's sakes, Ida! I feel as though I'm reliving the same scene over and over with you. How many times do you need to be told that White Aurasite cannot store ether for long periods? Being intangible matter, ether is given to dispersion. Only in its crystallized form is it a stable source of energy. I will test you later on this, so see to it you do not forget! 
Uh, right, yes. It's all coming back to me. So our hopes rest on good old crystals again, do they? While they are certainly reliable, they leave something to be desired in the area of portability. Indeed. I am reminded of the quantity of corrupted crystals required to thwart Leviathan, and the extraordinary lengths to which the Lamincens went to transport them. What if it should prove that a similar quantity was needed to destroy an Asian soul, or still more? I do not envy the poor sod who has to lug all of that around, on the off chance that an Asian appears. That's the very problem we set out to solve, and I reckon we've found the answer. If it isn't practical to lug around the ether we need, we'll just have to draw upon another source. And the only viable source is the land. If you mean to tap the Great River of Ether, know that it will entail considerable risk. Meddling with the currents may well induce a surge like to the one which despoiled Mordona. Give me a bit more credit, will you? Why would we need to tap the river when there are veritable reservoirs jutting out all over the land? Aye, I speak of corrupted crystals. It might be that their aspect is out of balance, but a crystal's a crystal. It contains ether, and we can help ourselves to it. While corrupted crystals are indeed abundant, there is no guarantee that they will be in close proximity at a crucial moment. But what if we don't need them to be? What if we could tap their power from afar? A uh, malm away, say? If we could do that, we'd have ready access to ether aplenty in almost every corner of Eorzea. I've yet to put my theories to the proof, but I've got a good feeling about this. If no one has any objections, I'd like to see where this avenue leads. If you think it worth your while, you have my blessing. But tell us, what are your theories? I, for one, am most eager to understand the process, however vaguely. I thought you might say that. But no one wants to listen to boring old theories all day, do they? I know I don't. So with your permission, I'd like to try something a bit more hands-on. I've already built an etheric siphon especially for this purpose, and I've been meaning to try it out. Thing is, the profusion of corrupted crystals in Mordona makes it something of a high-risk testing ground. If anything goes awry with the siphon, it would be better if it didn't happen within spitting distance of quite so much ether. Ideally, I need an isolated specimen. Does anyone know where I can find one? May I suggest Northern Thanalan? There you will find corrupted crystals of middling size, standing a reasonable distance apart. Ideal for your needs, I should have thought. Oh, and if you do elect to visit the place, I should be much obliged if you would assist me in another matter while you are in the area. Has something happened? Movement has been observed at Castrum Meridianum. During Operation Archon, the Alliance dealt the stronghold a heavy blow. Its facilities were extensively damaged, and its garrison reduced to a fraction of its former strength. Not long after our forces withdrew, however, their ranks were replenished by reinforcements from Castrum Sentry, they now seek to rebuild, and to this end, they have their sights set upon the Ceruleum Processing Plant. Having lost the Empire's support, the 14th Legion lacks the resources to sustain itself. To them, this is a bid for survival, and they will doubtless fight like desperate men. Though I have dispatched the Crystal Braves, I fear their strength alone may not suffice to stay the Imperial Assault. I would request the Scion's aid in the defensive effort. If I didn't know better, I'd say you were trying to inveigle us into fighting your battle with the promise of shiny crystals. Well 
then, consider me inveigled. I won't lie, the crystals you speak of sound perfect, so the Garlians have to go. Besides, we can't afford to beat about the bush. There's no telling when the Arsians will next appear. Thine eagerness to hurl thyself into the jaws of danger cometh as little surprise. Exercise due caution, I prithee. Though you have become a crystal brave, you are yet a scion, Alfino. We could hardly refuse you. Pray, join the crystal braves and lend them your support. Thangrid and Papa Limo shall accompany you. Ida and Yashtola, in the meantime I would have you assist Moonbreeder. Scout out the crystal clusters, that the testing may commence as soon as the Galian threat has been eliminated. If it please you, I shall continue mine own experiments on white orosite. Thank you, Ariange. Everyone, pray see to your preparations and depart as soon as you are able. Go well, and be safe. Hold on, I won't be a second. The beast seemed peckish, so I gave it a taste of my axe. I know, I know, as Uriange never tires of reminding me, an axe ill becometh the hand of a scholar. <sighs> what can I say? I like axes. To hear my mother tell it, I came into this world holding one. And it's not as if it stopped me picking up a quill, is it? <laughs> I often think of the man who introduced me to the joys of learning. He's one of the reasons I decided to come to Eorzea. Him and my excruciatingly stiff childhood friend. Considering how unalike we are, it's a wonder we ever got on. <laughs> <sighs> the world's a strange old place, isn't it? Aye, that ought to do it. So far, so good. At these concentrations, it shouldn't matter too much if something goes awry. Just enough ether to make it interesting. Did you see that? The way the crystal glowed? The siphon works, I'm happy to say. With a few refinements, it should satisfy our appetite for ether, which just leaves the small matter of forging our blade. I'm not sure how to go about it just yet, but I swear to find a way. I'll put a blade in your hands if it's the last thing I do. She senses me. A useful talent. Anassian, are they on to us? By your brand, I see you are an Archon of Charlian, keeper of knowledge, seeker of truth, meddler. I don't know what the hell's you're saying, but I don't much like your tone. <laughs> your instincts serve you well. But come, be not unsettled on my account. That lovely brow was not made for frowns. Ah, uh, but I waste my breath. Let me direct my words to one who understands them. We meet at last, warrior of light. I am Nabrialis. And you have long been a thorn in my side. I suffered the overweening presence of Lahabrea that men might host the power of gods, only for you to undo my hard work. Ah! Oh, 
hugger. Oh! Do settle down. You must concede that I acted in self-defense. But what's this? I do not sense the blessing of light. Oh dear. Could it be that frail Heidlin has forgotten her champion? This I did not foresee. Shorn of light as you are, you are no longer a threat. And better yet, the seal is broken. Now is the time to claim the staff. With it in my grasp, I shall rise above them all and take my place at Lord Zodiac's right hand. What did that bastard want with us? Nobriolus, he calls himself. <laughs> with charm like that, I'll bet he has maidens falling at his feet. Unconscious. But this staff... You say just talking about it had the bastard grinning like a brat on his name day. <laughs> Must be quite a staff. Oh, gods. He means Tupsimati, Master Louis Soir's staff. Minfilia's in danger. We have to get back to the Rising Stones. You too. So, you were able to divine my intent. What now, warrior of light? Ah, but that name is no longer fitting. You have become decidedly dull and quite incapable of barring my entry. What do you mean? You truly do not know. Then I suppose it is only right that I enlighten you. The blessing of light kept you and your fellow meddlers safe. It was that which prevented my kind from entering your domain. My kind, I say, though it had no power over the likes of Elidibus and La Habrea. Being of this world, they could come and go as they please, while I could only look on. But I need look no longer. Now that the seal is gone, I mean to act. Unlike the others, I am not given to waiting. I shall take that staff and bring about the next rejoining. Rejoining? Then it was your doing. The Isle of Val, the Scholars, all of it. You will not harm her! Why must you insist on forcing my hand? Did you learn nothing from our last meeting? Ah, but I forget. My words fall upon deaf ears. The staff is but a broken relic. A memorial to the departed. What possible use could you have for it? What use? You mean to say that all this time you kept the key, never knowing what it was you possessed? The Staff Tupsimati, or rather the stone tablet it bears, is host to a great power. 
Together with the horn, it can be used to draw vast quantities of ether from its bearer's surroundings. How else do you think Louis Soi was able to invoke the power of the Twelve without making them an offering of crystals? Summoning requires not only prayer, but a profusion of ether. Even a child knows that. If I did not know before, you may be certain I do now. But above all, I know that we cannot allow this staff to fall into your hands. I will die before I let you take it. Insufferable woman. I would happily end your miserable life here and now. Alas, Elidibus would never let me hear the end of it. Very well. If you will not part with the staff, I will take you too. After them! Quickly! Before the rift closes! You're safe. Thank the Twelve. You may have bested me this day. But what of the next? What of all the days to come? Remember, light no longer holds sway here. I may return whensoever I wish, again and again and again. Eventually, you will falter, and the staff will be mine. Until next time, Scions. There will be no next time. This is the end. What? What trickery is this? 
No, no, you cannot. No. Use Toop Samati to gather ether. Quickly, before he breaks free. Concentrate. Call to mind the time you struck down La Habrea with the Blade of Light. Why won't it work? Is it because we lack the blessing of light? Damn it. So much ether. And it still isn't enough. Fools! No mortal prison can contain me! I shall make you pay for your insolence! Hearken to our plea. Lend us your divine light. Why can you not hear us? Do our words no longer reach you? If only we had a bit more ether. Moonbreeder, what are you doing? Master Louisois, I understand now the choice you made. In death, there is life. Farewell, Urianche. You daft old coop. Breeder, no, you mustn't. What? No, it, it cannot end. I am eternal. I am immortal! Moon Breeder. She's... She's gone. You did it, my friend. The Asian is dead. This device is a legacy of Moonbreeder's toils and sacrifice. I shall hold on to it for safekeeping. Minfilia, uh, are you alright? I am. Oh, we were surveying northern Thanalan when we received the distress call. We returned as swiftly as we were able. It seems you have everything in hand, however. What happened here? Where is Moonbreeda?
She gave her life to temper the Blade of Light. I... I have no words. Rather than await the inevitable, she took her fate into her own hands. Does... does Arianje know? My friend, there is something I must tell you. I heard all, my lady. The moon sinketh, taking her leave of the heavens, yet her passing heraldeth the coming of a new day. <laughs> Moonbreeder hath fulfilled her destiny, hath she not? Long ago, far across the seas in the Charlayan motherland, Moonbreeder and I did study under the sage tutelage of Master Louis Soi. Full off did he impress upon us that knowledge existeth to serve the greater good. This sentiment, however, was contrary to the nation's policy of neutrality, which censured intercedence in the affairs of foreign lands. In spite of vehement opposition, he founded the Circle of Knowing and journeyed hitherto the heart of Eorzea. Through his noble sacrifice was the realm spared its doom. Yet this great soul, whom all should rightly have honored, was branded a pariah in his own land. His peers did accuse him of forsaking his duty as a man of learning and of meddling in the course of history. When he left Charleyan behind, Master Louis Soir gave no word to signal his intent to Moonbreeder. Close as they were, as master and disciple, she was deeply wounded by the sudden exclusion from his confidence. Above all, however, she was confused. Try as she might, she could ill comprehend her master's motive. The slanders that were heaped upon him after his passing served only to inflame the turmoil within her. For years upon end, she knew not what to believe. Torn as she was, twixt the man whom she revered and the man who forsook her and his duty both. The Louis Soir I knew would never forsake his duty, much less one of his own. This I know full well, my lady. T'was not for want of love that Master Louis Soir hid his intent. He but desired that Moonbreeder discover her own path, free of the shadow of his influence. Long did I contemplate revealing the truth to her, and long did I hold my peace. After all, was it not Master Louis Soir's wish that she come to the truth unaided? Uh, I told myself it was, and resolved to let her suffer. Knowingly did I deny my friend the comfort she craved. And now she hath gone to her rest, with doubt still in her heart. Speakest thou in earnest? Did Moonbreeder truly come to understand Master Louis Soir's will before the end? <laughs> oh, the realization hath set her free. She may now find the peace which hath for so long eluded her. Oh, Moonbreeder, my dearest, how oh, I shall miss thee. Moonbreeder gave her life that we might possess the means to defeat the Asians. Her sacrifice must not be in vain. Let us continue her work on the Blade of Aether and see it to completion. My lady, 
I would mourn, Moonbreeder, in mine own way. I beg your permission to return to the Waking Sands. Of course, my friend. Take all the time you require. We shall be here should you have need of us. Forgive me, Moonbreeder. Had I been quicker, or wiser, but I was not, and you paid the price. But you would not suffer us to wallow in our sorrow, would you? You would tell us to pick ourselves up and get on with it. And so we shall. We shall defend this realm and her people to the last. Life for death, a fair exchange. Other bargains will be struck. I'll never forget you, Moon. None of us will. The song riseth to a crescendo. Is that what I think it is? Hello, can you hear me? We have received grave tidings from Ishgard. Pray return to the Rising Stones at once. The sons must answer for their father's misdeeds. Only then will the cycle be broken.
brothers and sisters of the heavens, we raise our voices and join you in the chorus. The sinner's feeble magics are undone. Come, claim your retribution. <laughs> Alfino, it is good to see you. Tell me, what have you learned? Pray summon the others. Everyone must hear my report. So this was all but a taste of what's to come. Indeed. The main host advances upon Ishgard as we speak. Whose vaunted defenses have been nullified. Shorn of its wards, the city will bear the full force of Nidhogg's fury. All those people. Alfino is right. The Dravanians cannot be allowed to prevail. If Ishgard falls, all of Eorzea will suffer the consequences. Then you agree that we have no choice but to intervene. For the good of the realm, the Scions of the Seventh Dawn and the Crystal Braves must join the defense of Ishgard. Let there be no ambiguity about what has been proposed we would be directly intervening in the war. But if all here believe the cause to be just, then to war we shall go. The path we now embark upon is perilous, but I pray you will walk with us to the end. For those we have lost, for those we can yet save. Then it is settled. I shall inform the Council of our intentions and request that they contribute their own forces to the defense of Ishgard. We are well aware of Ishgard's dilemma, and we agree with your assessment. Then I trust there are no objections to the Crystal Brave's intervention. Uldar has not. Gridonia does not object. The Crystal Braves are yours to command, Alfino. Do what you will. We shall pray for your success. It was my hope that you would offer more substantial aid than prayer. I know it is within your means. Do 
not presume that you have knowledge of our every concern. The Garlians and the Beast Tribes are but two of many. We are not in a position to contribute greatly to the defense of Ishgard, not when our own homes are still under siege. We dare not leave our interests in Cartano undefended as well. Telegi Adelegi and his ilk would seize control of the territories in our absence. The enemy is at their gates, and you would cower behind yours? No one is cowering, boy. We will offer what support we can. Aye. Support. A handful of men and no more. Would that we could commit more than a token force to this cause. Yet there are others to whom you might turn. The free companies ever want for work. Ah, yes. The free companies. They're not like to turn you down. I beg your pardon? You would entrust the survival of Ishgard to sell swords? Crises like these are the very reason why this alliance was formed. It is our duty to aid our fellow man. My duty is to my country and my people. If you expect us to place the welfare of a foreign power above our own, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Lest you doubt, Limsa comes first, then the alliance, and finally... Circumstances permitting, Ishgard and the rest. If you cannot understand so simple a concept, then you have no place at this table. Forgive me, Admiral. I was careless in my choice of words. I suggest you assemble a party of elite adventurers, assuming you haven't already. Your fellows served us well during Operation Archon. I dare say they will do so again. If I may, Your Grace, I wish to propose a redistribution of forces. If we entrust the security of Uldar to the Brass Blades for a time, we can dispatch a larger force to Ishgard. Your Grace? Yes. Yes, of course. Do what you will. Is her grace not feeling well? To the best of my knowledge, her grace is in perfect health. I see. Carry on.
Sultan Tree, hallowed spirit of my line. Through my weakness, the glorious house of Ul has all but disappeared beneath the sands. For want of the strength to raise it up again, it were better that it fall. Forgive me, but I know not what else to do. You needn't trouble yourself, so. Your grace is most kind, but it is no trouble to me, rather an honor. If your grace is ready, I shall summon the warrior of light. I am. Everyone looks to be in high spirits. With good cause. A common victory may serve to unite even the most unlikely of allies. You've brought us one step closer to a united Eorzea. Your modesty knows no bounds, Antecedent. Were it not for your efforts, Sir Emmerich would never have become such a steadfast ally. When he convinces his countrymen to rejoin the Alliance, we shall all reap the benefits, military and economic. I tell you, we are on the cusp of a new era of unity and prosperity. Territorial disputes are all that divide us now. But I have faith that we will find an amicable solution in time. And failing that, I'll have my trusty warrior of light box the ears of all concerned. Speaking of whom... She will be joining us shortly. A matter at the quicksand required her attention, but it did not sound serious. Enter. Your Grace, your guest has arrived. Pray come in and take your ease. Is well that the steps of faith held against the horde. And what of the city proper? We sustained some few losses, but the heart of our nation yet beats with vigor. I am not certain I could say the same had we not received your most generous aid. An attack on Ishgard is an attack on the realm. We stand together or fall divided. Such noble words, after the fact. I 
I had hoped to speak in the presence of her grace, but it seems she has been delayed. That being the case, now would seem as good a time as any. Honored friends, pray allow me to convey Ishgard's warmest gratitude for your part in the defense of our lands. Tis upon the success of this very alliance that my recommendation to throw open the gates of judgment shall be founded. With the blessing of the Archbishop, it is my hope that Ishgard will soon be reunited with her long-estranged sister nations, and that Eorzea shall once more be as one. Very well. Is Artemis? Nothing to worry about. I shall return anon. You wished a word, Yu Yu Hase? You may go. Your Grace. You must be curious as to the reason for this private audience. The matter I would discuss, however, will soon make apparent the need for discretion. I intend to abdicate the throne and dissolve the monarchy. You have seen for yourself the storm of turmoil that howls through our streets. The government fails in its responsibilities, and my subjects suffer the consequences of our incompetence. But I will see them suffer no longer. The Victory Feast shall provide the stage on which I declare the dissolution of the Sultanate. Tis mine intent that the ruling class of our golden city should take its place beside the common man in a fair and equitable republic. No more shall this nation bow to the whims of a privileged few. Yet, that which I propose will entail the tearing up of this city's very foundations. And even Roban, with all his strength and influence, will be hard-pressed to keep his footing on such treacherous ground. Thus would I ask you to lend him a steadying hand. You who have endured the wrath of innumerable foes are the one hero in whom I can place my trust. Will you do this thing for me? I am truly grateful. More grateful than I can well express. Much of my dread for the coming days has been quieted. Thank you. 
Your Grace! Her Grace, the Sultana, is dead. Poison in her wine? You! You did this! Spare us your denials! I see no other suspects, and the room has but the one entrance. I hereby accuse you of regicide! Men, arrest this viper! Sir, barring a few exceptions, we have detained all those with allegiance to the Scions. The Rising Stones is also under our control. And what do you hope to achieve with this mutiny? Why, that which we have striven for all along, Commander. The salvation of Eorzea. What is the meaning of this? Knights from the homeland. This cannot bode well. Lord Commander, we have received an urgent message from the Holy See. I am grieved to report that your serpentine foes have resumed their assault. Needless to say, your presence is urgently required. These knights have come to bear you swiftly home to Ishgard. A surprise attack. We've had no such word from our men, and the timing is most fortuitous to catch us away from the city. Most fortuitous indeed. Lord Commander, we must away! You have been a most gracious host. I hope that I might one day return the favor. Come, Lucia. Whatever is going on in there? Ah, the ever-dutiful brass blades. I must apologize, but my dance card is rather full. Another time, perhaps? Thancred, of the Scions of the Seventh Dawn. You stand accused of committing acts of espionage in service to the Galian Empire. Espionage? 
What in the seven hells are you talking about? Ah, if you're referring to that business with the Ultima weapon, then you must understand, I, I wasn't myself. Under interrogation, an Imperial prisoner revealed your involvement in numerous dealings with the enemy. We've also been investigating reports that you are a practitioner of forbidden arts. You'd best come along with us. You invite me to your party and now you want me to leave? I do so detest receiving mixed signals. Come then. I believe I've lost my appetite for this farce of a celebration. You go too far, Lord Adelegi. By what right do you march armed soldiers into a royal banquet and eject state visitors without her grace's consent? You treat the brass blades as your personal army and show contempt for the throne with your every act. Leave us. Now. Is that an order, General? Mayhap you have mistaken me for one of your flames! You will find I am not so slavishly obedient. <laughs> As you lecture me on personal armies! As for your outrageous claim that I have shown contempt for the throne, let all here observe that it was not I who feasted while an assassin removed its occupant. I expect this is your idea of defending the nation, is it? This and diluting our forces through these distractions in Cartano and Curthus. I do begin to see how the ranks of the immortal flames came to be riddled with Garlean sympathizers. You are plainly unfit for command. Wait. Wait, gods damn you. Your words make no sense. What assassin? You mean to say you don't know? We caught the vaunted champion of the Scions in Her Grace's private chambers, not moments after the deed was done. No! No, this cannot be! Save your breath! You will need it to plead your case. You and your entire order are to be tried for this atrocity. in the prisoner. This woman stands accused of poisoning Her Royal Majesty Nanamu Unamo and his suspected accessories to the crime all members of the Scions of the Seventh Dawn will be detained for questioning. This is madness! What a pity. Who'd have thought your tale would end like this? Should you demand further proof, a vial with traces of the substance used to poison her grace was found upon the assassin's person. How very convenient. You would speak of convenience? Who persuaded Her Grace to host this celebration? A diversion which presented you and your confederates ample opportunity to commit the crime, and a crowd within which to fade from view! A more convenient occasion I could scarcely imagine. How dare you! 
After all we have done for Uldar! Hold your tongue, witch! I'll not be ensorcelled! I know all about the dark gift that you and your disciples wield. Oh yes, I've observed how you worked upon the minds of the Alliance leaders, bending them to your will. And what of your cordial relationship with Sir Emmerich? For years, Ishgard abjured all contact with the outside world, and now the Lord Commander of the Temple Knights treats you with the familiarity of a childhood friend. I'll tell you what I think. I think this desperate defense of Ishgard was but a ruse to deceive us into dividing our forces. Your next move will be to charm your Kurthan allies into invading our lands! Now that is truly ridiculous! How do you even think of this stuff? She... she cannot be dead. Stand aside, Ilbert. I want to see the Sultana. Spare yourself the pain, brother. I saw her with my own eyes. For a mercy, the poison took her swiftly. Her handmaiden can attest to that. This cannot be. Nanamo. Nanamo. No! Plainly, the Royalists can no longer be relied upon to keep our nation safe. And so it falls to the Monitorists of the Syndicate to govern Uldar. But should you wish to help us, General, we would be more than happy to entrust the task of planning Her Grace's funeral to you. It seems only right that you should bury your precious Sultana, and we will be glad to be rid of that burden. I'll bet you will. You more than any man. Whatever do you mean? I mean you had her killed, you black-hearted bastard! <laughs> what rot! <laughs> Though I did have sufficient motive, tis true. That young lady caused me no end of grief. She always was a most unwilling puppet. I dare say her grace was grateful that someone thought to cut her strings. You would mock her, then mock her from hell! What? Have you lost your mind, General? It is forbidden to draw steel in the royal chambers, much less slaughter our fellow Syndicate members. <gasps> You're one of them! You've been in league with the Scions all along! You! You're next, you scheming bastard! Oh, Rabon! Seven hells!
Admiral, we must leave. How unlike you, old friend. I did not expect to take your arm so easily. Take the Scions into custody. They have conspired to commit regicide. And arrest this traitor as well. Gilbert, I hope you choke on their coin. Tis better than the dirt I've supped on these long years. We can't all abandon Alamigo and become great war heroes as you have. You are not the man you once were, Raban. Since that girl strapped the yoke around your neck, you become docile. She took the mad bull and cut off his balls, and a bull that cannot rot is fit for naught but slaughter. Shall I tell you who really killed your precious Sultana? It was me. You... You die! I never doubted you, not for a moment. But there is more to this than I yet understand. Flee this place. Clear your names. Find out who is behind this plot. It is the only way. Now go! Ah, there you are. Sancred, where have you been? Avoiding the fumbling advances of some very persistent admirers. When I realized the celebrations had turned sour, it seemed prudent to slip away and take stock of the situation. It would appear that much of the city is already under tight guard. It occurs to me that expanding the Brass Blade's authority may not have been such a wonderful idea after all. The success of this plan was contingent upon those thugs having the run of the place. Just how long has this scheme been in motion? The careful preparations, the maneuvering of forces. I am inclined to agree with the General's insistence that a deeper plot exists here. So, 
Would I be right in thinking we now have an excuse to pummel as many brass blades as we like? Unless you plan on pummeling them all, I'm not sure that will greatly aid our cause. The Sultana's assassination was but one part of the scheme. We two were its targets. And though we did not share Pornonimo's fate, we are yet hobbled by the charges laid at our door. Where now might we seek refuge? Where indeed, we may safely assume that our foe has thought to have the Rising Stones watched. Forgive me for stating the obvious, but our choice of destination will matter little if we cannot secure an escape route out of Ulda. Happily, I believe I can provide one. Papashan once told me about the passages hidden in the walls of the palace. If I recall correctly, the fireplace in Anima's chambers conceals the entrance to a tunnel. It should lead outside the city and allow us to avoid any messy confrontations. The rest of you, go on ahead. I'll handle this lot. By yourself? Oh, I suppose I shall just have to join you. Crystal Braves too, huh? Now this should be interesting. Ida! Papalimo! We will hold our pursuers here. Hurry, now! Find this tunnel of Thancreds! Minfilia, we cannot linger! Now look what you've done! Ida, are you alright? There are just too many of them! I'm fine. I could do this all day. How about you? Nearing the end of my tether. We're the Scions of the Seventh Dawn, the ones who stand between this realm and the evil that's trying to destroy it. And if you think we'll leave the stewardship of Eorzea to the likes of your masters, then you're solely mistaken. Sorry I dragged you into this, Popolimo. <laughs> Tis hardly the first time, and I'll be damned if it will be the last. Let them have it! 
Ready, Ida. I was hoping you'd say that. I never knew such a watercourse existed beneath Uldar. The architecture is of the Sildeen style, if I'm not mistaken. The ancients plainly foresaw the need for a ready means of escape. This way! Well, that didn't take long. It seems these tunnels were not as secret as I had hoped. You two, go on ahead. Thancord and I will deal with this. Wha what do you mean to do? Only that which is required to ensure that the dawn's light survive to brighten the morrow. Fear not, Antecedent. You haven't seen the last of these fair features. My friends! Leave us! What is the plan, milady? Shall I take the dozen on the left and you the dozen on the right? The odds are not exactly stacked in our favor. Numbers will count for little when I bring the tunnel down upon their heads. Though I cannot say I relish the thought of being entombed with you for all eternity. You wound me. I will have you know that many a maid would kill for the chance to spend forever at my side. Now, may I have the last dance? Going splendidly. Now would be a good time, my lady. Tis done. Forgive me, Mitra. Farewell, Minfilia. Hydalin, she she speaks to me. No. I must remain behind. 
But you cannot stay with me. Please, you must go on. You are the warrior of light. You are hope for the Scions and for all the realm. As long as your flame continues to burn, the light of the dawn may ever be relit. You must escape and save Eorzea from those who would plunge it into darkness. Tis the only way. I am glad to see you safe, my friend. What of the others? Damn that man! Taleji played me for a fool! I thought the Crystal Brave's mine till the very moment I felt the blade at my back. There will be ample time for soul searching later. For now, we must put some moms between us and Ulda. Well, would you look who it is? Need a ride? I doubt it'll be half as exciting as the last trip we took. Not if I have anything to say about it, anyway. Let's not dawdle, eh? All aboard! I was stocking up on supplies over in Vesper Bay, you see, when your sister come up and begged a favour. Said her brother was having some trouble down in Ulda and likely needed a helping hand getting away. But thinking them ruins would make a fine hiding place, I decided to try there first. And lo and behold, there you were. Aye, and judging by them soldiers as were pouring out of the city, I arrived not a moment too soon. Ha! <laughs> Must have been fate that we happened to find you there, though, eh? I had thought to look out for Alize, but would appear she was the one watching over me. I've made such a mess of things. And who might you be, young sir?
Pippin Taropin, Vice Marshal of the Immortal Flames. I had been on the Alamegan front these past few moons, but an urgent communication called me back to Uldar. Scarce had my boots touched the cobbles, though, when the streets erupted with cries of assassination. I immediately went in search of answers, and came across Master Alfino here. Needless to say, I did not think his imprisonment justified. The blame plainly lies with the Monetarists. Their greed and corruption are well known to me, but for them to take advantage of the situation with such alacrity... Was that Pippin, you said? Ain't that the name of General Alden's lad? Yes, I am his son. Adopted, of course. It was only as we were leaving Uldar that I learned of father's fate. Once I have seen you a safe distance away, I mean to return to the city and extricate him from this madness. Then you needn't travel no further than Blackbrush. Our fugitives have a friend waiting for them there. I dreamed of bringing about Eorzea's salvation, but in the end... Was I who needed saving? There has been word from the capital. Ishgard has weathered another assault, and tis said several wyverns broke through into the city proper. The Temple Knights succeeded in slaying the beasts, but the intrusion prompted orders to further strengthen the guard and to place the city under a perpetual state of alert. How keenly we feel the loss of our wards at the Gates of Judgment. Yet we must not bemoan our misfortune. Sir Emmerich is safely returned from Uldar and once more leads the defense of Ishgard. As for the matter of your asylum, I am afraid no progress will be made until the threat to our nation is diminished. But do not despair. You are not without allies. You are more than welcome to shelter here for as long as you wish. Pray, think of it as a new headquarters of sorts. The falling snows or some such. All frivolity aside, any who come here in search of you will receive no aid from House Fortan. For once, the Ishgardian reputation for inhospitality shall work in our favor. Agents of Uldar will find their every inquiry dismissed and their every request for entry rebuffed until such time as their masters have acknowledged your innocence. You once fought to preserve the honor of my dear friend. Tis a blessing that I may now repay that debt in kind. But let us dwell no more on this. Pray, join the rest of your companions. Tis bitterly cold this day. I suspect there are those who might welcome the warmth your presence brings. It is all my doing. I believed myself the only one who truly understood Eorzea's woes, and look what that arrogance has wrought. I gave commands, influenced governments with my certainty. I treated the Crystal Braves and even the Scions themselves as pawns in my great scheme to save the realm. But in my headlong rush into imagined glory, I paid no heed to the ground upon which I trod. The salvation of Eorzea. What was it that I hoped to achieve? 
Did I believe that I could rid the realm of every danger and difficulty? That I could defeat the Empire and the Asians, and find homes for every refugee? Oh yes, I was so very clever. Become a guardian of Eorzea, I implored, and sat back to watch my perfect army cleanse the land of chaos. It was all but a means to feed my own vanity. Only when all is lost do I finally realize the truth. Oh, Alfino. So, Master Alfino, are you content to remain a broken blade? Is there no flame hot enough to reforge you? What of the fine companions who yet stand at your side? I dare say the fires of their determination will soon have you slicing the air again with your customary wit. I hardly deserve such friendship. And besides, where are we to go? not serve our purpose, then... then we shall go to Ishgard. Minfilia told me many times, as long as we stand fast against despair, the beacon of hope will never be lost to sight. Be it in the snow or in the clouds, we few will see that the dawn's light shines again. <laughs> You are right, Totoro. Thank you. And thank you for your kind words, Lord Orshfong. Tis true that Eorzea yet has her guardians. The Scions have achieved much, and would be remiss of me to discard it all in a fit of self-pity. Let us then resume our journey, together. One step at a time. All has been arranged as you desired, my lord. Sanctuary lieth beyond. Delusion, despair, death. Thou shalt find naught else here. 